believe that is, is, is viable and the Israelis believe that is viable to get to that <coughs> state. So it is a decision, of course, for the Palestinians to make. And uh, as I say, uh, we support their uh, enhanced status at the, UN, uh, at the United Nations. <coughs> Thank you. Um, that ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Shona Robison on Glasgow 2014, the 20th Commonwealth Games. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I now call on Shona Robinson, Cabinet Secretary. You've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much. It's with great pride that I make this uh, statement today, reflecting on the successful delivery of the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games and what a fortnight it has been. From the very first moments of the opening ceremony, the Commonwealth Games have been a huge credit to Glasgow and to Scotland. The atmosphere, not just in Glasgow, but across the country, has been electric. Every competitor from the, the furthest and nearest reaches of the Commonwealth has experienced the warm welcome and support of the people of Scotland. Team Scotland were absolutely phenomenal. They pulled off a record medal haul smashing previous totals, smashing national records and personal bests. The final tally of 53 medals, 19 of those gold, is a fantastic reflection of the commitment and dedication of every single member of the team. Um, it's also, I have to say, an excellent return on the 50 million investment that we have made in Commonwealth Games sports and performance programmes through Sports Scotland. And who could forget the beaming smile of Eric Davies as she received her medal, or Ross Murdoch's joy when he realised he had won gold. Very special moments indeed. A personal high note of mine was when I had the unique privilege of awarding Scotland's first medal of the Games to Ailey McGlynn OBE and partner Louise Haston after they won silver in the tandem sprint. The number of spectators at the Games exceeded all expectations, with a remarkable 1.2 uh, million tickets sold. Time after time, we saw amazing crowds who really helped make the Games and cheered on athletes, whether they were winning or not. At Ibrox, we had the largest crowd at a Rugby Sevens tournament anywhere in the world ever. Over half a million people participated in the Festival 2014 events, and the Lawn Bowls at Kelvin Grove saw sellout crowds. And of course, it wasn't just the sport that was unforgettable. Memories of John Barrowman's kiss, trotting Scotty dogs, South African soprano uh, Pimenza Matsukitsa uh, singing Freedom Kamoi, and the incredible £5 million raised for UNICEF at the opening ceremony will, I'm sure, stay with us all. And of course, the closing ceremony was particularly moving. Doogie McLean's Caledonia, and the CGF flag being lowered to Afon Kiss, uh, I think that really captured the mood of the nation at that moment. No games could happen without a vast amount of hard work from an incredible range of people. And it gives me great pleasure to formally offer my thanks to everyone who played a part in delivering these games. There's always a risk when you start listing particular individuals or organisations that you miss one out, but that's a risk I'm willing to take this afternoon as there are some groups and people that really deserve a particular thank you. First of all, I want to pay tribute to colleagues in the Chamber who have supported the vision and ambition of these games, in particular Patricia Ferguson, who guided the bid in its early stages, and also to Lord McConnell, who as previous First Minister initially spearheaded the bid and has continued to be a strong and enthusiastic supporter of the games. To Glasgow City Council as host city, they have been a crucial partner throughout the seven years of preparation, as well as the 11 days of sporting competition. Their significant contribution, their work in delivering venues for the Games and how they stepped up their normal city operations work to ensure that the city sparkled was vital. The passion, professionalism and perseverance of the whole team at Glasgow City Council cannot be overstated and we owe them our thanks. We must remember too the contribution of local authorities beyond Glasgow. Angus, Dundee, Edinburgh, North Lanarkshire, South Lanarkshire and East Dumbartonshire all hosted Games venues and did a sterling job to ensure that the experience of athletes and spectators at events out with Glasgow matched those of the host city itself. And of course, every local authority took part in the curtain raiser to the Games, the Queen's Baton Relay, affording it a fantastic welcome. 
Commonwealth Games Scotland, as the host, Commonwealth Games Association have played an important role in supporting the delivery of the Games. They have done a tremendous job, not least in preparing Team Scotland. My special thanks to Chairman Michael Kavanagh and Chef de Mission John Doig. The team's success owes a great deal to the work of Sport Scotland and their world-class sporting system model. That approach has developed and inspired all of our 310 athletes at these Games and, of course, uh, delivered the biggest ever pool of talent for Commonwealth Games Scotland to draw on. I want to take the opportunity to formally thank Louise Martin, Chair of Sports Scotland and also the Honorary Secretary of the Commonwealth Games Federation. Her passion and commitment in both roles has made a significant contribution to the success of the Games and I want to recognise her fundamental role in winning the bid for Glasgow and Scotland. Much of the painstaking preparation for the Games was undertaken, of course, by the organising committee, the organisation set up by Commonwealth Games Scotland, Glasgow City Council and the Scottish Government to stage the Games. A personal thanks to Lord Smith, Chair of the Organising Committee and Chief Executive David Grevenberg, and we wish him well in his new role. From incredibly visible aspects of Games planning, such as the memorable ceremonies, to the unseen minutiae of sorting out volunteer shift rosters, the organising committee has worked tirelessly to ensure that every aspect of the Games ran smoothly. Police Scotland did a fantastic job working with a broad range of partners to deliver a safe and secure Games. The patient and friendly approach of police officers across the Games venues was wonderful. Both the visible and hidden work of all the emergency services was crucial to the success of the Games, and I am grateful to them all. A particular thanks is also due to the armed forces for their support to the security effort. At any Games, transport planning is always going to be a particular challenge, and these Games represented probably one of the most complex transport challenges Scotland has ever faced, with almost 700,000 people visiting the city over the weekend of the 26th and 27th of July alone. And I give my thanks to those who worked tirelessly to keep us on the move. Despite everyone's best endeavours, some people did experience difficulties and every effort was made to resolve problems quickly and learning from this will be used in future events. As Parliament will remember, one of the key aspirations for the Games was to celebrate diversity and deliver a truly inclusive programme. I would like to thank our partners for sharing in this vision and including these considerations in their planning and dealing with workforce, athletes and the public alike to deliver a truly accessible Games. I am delighted too that with our support, Pride House saw many visitors from across Scotland and the Commonwealth and was a great success. I also want to pay a special thanks to the people of Dalmarnock and other communities around Games venues who have shown great patience and understanding in the face of disruption caused by the Games. I am very confident that the long-term benefits to those areas will be substantial and to the regeneration of the East End uh, of Glasgow, and of course that will continue. So to every community in Glasgow and further afield that hosted Games activities, a big thank you. The biggest thank you, however, I think it has to go to the real heroes of the Games, who gave up their holidays or took time off work so that they could volunteer to make the Games a success. They were, without doubt, the face of the Games, and the Games could not have happened without them. The Clyde Siders and the host city volunteers had unstoppable enthusiasm, limitless energy, and an unending willingness to go the extra mile. The Games could not happen without them, and a great big thank you to each and every one of them. It, it's hard to believe that it's only 40 hours since the closing ceremony brought the Games to an end, with the Commonwealth joining together to sing Auld Lang Syne. The Games may be over, but the story of the Games most certainly is not. We've always been clear that a legacy will not happen by chance, that we must continue to work long after the closing ceremony to ensure that it continues to be delivered for the whole of Scotland. And I'm pleased that this chamber will have an opportunity on Thursday to discuss the Games' legacy. Now, however, it is right to, to pause and take a moment to reflect on the extraordinary events of the last fortnight. With the eyes of the world turned to Glasgow two, two weeks ago, we were ready. We showed the world that Scotland provides the perfect stage to host major events. We showed that our people are amongst the friendliest and that even the Scottish weather can occasionally rise uh, to, uh, to sh sh shine sunshine on us. Through hard work, grit and good humour, we have proven that when we are handed such a great responsibility, Scotland delivers. 
The Games were described by Mike Cooper, the Chief Executive Officer of the Commonwealth Games Federation, as the standout Games in the history of the Commonwealth Movement, and we thank him for those kind words. But I can't think of a better way to end this statement than echoing the words of Prince Imran, the President of the Commonwealth Games Federation, who has been a great uh, supporter of the Games and a great friend of Glasgow and of Scotland. And he closed the Games with the declaration that the Games had been pure, dead, brilliant in a tremendous Scottish accent that I'm sure he must have been practising for quite some time. All I can say is that I agree with him. Uh, Scotland ha and Glasgow have done us proud and each and every one of us in this chamber should be extremely proud of what has been achieved. Thank you. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we must move to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button now. And I call on Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I, in opening, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her statement and for providing advance sight of it. It's not often we hear a Cabinet Secretary talking about something being pure dead brilliant, or indeed a member of royalty. But on this occasion, I think they were both spot on. The Cabinet Secretary, in her 10-minute contribution, of course, had time to praise all the many uh, people and organisations who contributed to making the game such a success. I don't have time, obviously, to mention them all, so I would simply want to add my praise and thanks to all those the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, perhaps with one exception, in the interest of modesty. Um, but I would also like to add one or two additional people, if I may. And they're people who deserve our praise and our thanks. And I don't think the, the Cabinet Secretary missed them out deliberately, but she did include them in uh, her, her comments earlier on. But I think we should also mention the Executive Member for the Games at Glasgow City Council, Councillor Archie Graham, who led within the City Council um, Bridget McConnell of the City Council, who was involved in the bid from 2002, when it was first an idea and a vision, and who led and delivered uh, in that department the venues and the sport and culture uh, events. And also uh, Mike Hooper, the Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Games Federation, who, while always maintaining the impartiality you would expect from someone in that role, uh, always was welcoming and ready to show support and help to Glasgow's bid in the early stages as well as after we had won in 2007. And of course he will stand down in a few short months time and deserves to have our thanks and praise. And of course the Cabinet Secretary herself who has uh, since her appointment led from the front with this. I know that this is not always an easy task. I have described it sometimes as the best job in government and it is but it is not without its challenges. So well done also to the Cabinet Secretary and her team for everything that they've done. And I think it's right that we reflect, as we have done, on the wonderful events of the last two weeks. And we have all enjoyed a marvellous experience. I'm not sure if all the volunteers did have such limitless um, energy as the Cabinet Secretary uh, described. I, for one, am still knackered and don't expect to be anything other for at least another week. But um, that's perhaps more about me and my level of fitness than anything else. But I think it's important too that we recognise that the enthusiasm that Glasgow and Scotland showed for those games also showed us that a multi-games, multi-sport event such as the Commonwealth Games can be a real impetus for change in our country. It can inspire people to be more active more often, as we all want them to be. And it can make that difference, it can be that spark that encourages someone to take up sport and to see it through to become a competitor and hopefully a winner in the future. Now, I'm a supporter, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, of the legacy programme that both the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council have delivered. But I wonder if she would, perhaps ahead of Thursday's debate, say a little bit of how we harness the impetus that there is, how we make sure that we don't lose any time, that we move quickly to make sure that the opportunities that the Games have given us to make that step change in Scotland's life and culture actually happens. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I... Um 
thank um, uh, Patricia Ferguson and I hope she did enjoy her time as a, a Clyde Cider. I saw her in action, very impressive. Uh, can I also pay tribute to Archie Graham? I mean, sometimes I saw Councillor Graham more than I saw my husband um, over the last... There, I know. Um, but, you know, it was a team, it was a team effort. <laughs> uh, a team effort. Bridget McConnell, I should, have, um, should say, she did a tremendous job uh, with the opening and closing ceremonies and having oversight uh, of that. Mike Hooper, wish him best wishes in his retirement, which I'm sure he's very much looking forward to. And the, the Team Scotland, in its broadest sense, was absolutely the team that delivered. Scottish Government staff, uh, agency staff, council staff, and everybody, it was all shoulders to the wheel. In terms of the uh, legacy going forward, obviously Thursday does give us the opportunity to talk about that in more detail, but I'm very keen to keep the momentum going because we have 50 fantastic national legacy programmes which are delivering uh, real change uh, in communities, but those take time. So uh, I'm very keen that we do keep the momentum uh, going and we'll have uh, more opportunity to discuss that in some detail uh, on Thursday, which I look forward to. Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I add uh, a very strong uh, sense of thanks and uh, congratulations uh, to uh, everybody who was involved in the Commonwealth Games. I think they were outstanding. Um, I'm going to give my age away, but uh, that was the third Commonwealth Games that I have attended as a spectator, and I've been at two Olympics, and nothing compares uh, with the uh, atmosphere that we had in Glasgow. Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, you didn't add uh, congratulations to the two governments, both the Scottish Government and to the UK Government, who I think worked extraordinarily hard and uh, proved that just how successful it can be when these two governments uh, come together. Uh, on a general theme, uh, you've mentioned obviously about the legacy and the fact that we have an opportunity on Thursday to uh, debate this. Uh, could I ask for a specific commitment in that debate that we look at uh, the uh, legacy as far as our uh, younger children are concerned, particularly in primary school, because that's at the age where they first take up their interest and enthusiasm for sport. And if we uh, could have a commitment for that debate, uh, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, obviously, in... Uh Paying tribute to the armed forces, the, um, that was secured through negotiation with the UK government and uh, we um, are uh, particularly pleased that was the outcome of, of those discussions because I think the uh, armed forces provided uh, a very important look and feel along with Police Scotland to the, the front of house experience that spectators had and they did a, a tremendous job so we certainly do recognise uh, that contribution. Um, in terms of the, the legacy that, um, that Liz Smith wants us to focus on in terms, terms of children. There's a lot to say around that because a lot of the legacy programmes have focused uh, around young children. I can certainly give her that commitment uh, going forward. Sandra White, followed by Hans Alan Malik. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I also congratulate everyone for facilitating a uh, fantastic Glasgow Commonwealth Games? A special thanks to my fellow Glaswegians who made everyone uh, so very, very welcome and thoroughly enjoyed themselves also. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, with a record haul of medals won by Team Scotland Women, uh, can I ask what plans there are to encourage more female participation in sport? Uh, well, can I first of all say what a fantastic job our female athletes did. Uh, they were, I think, approximately 46% of the team and they won uh, just short of 40% of the medals. And what was really good was to see our media profiling women athletes. In fact, one day there was a whole page of women athletes who had performed. And I th would really like to think that that might continue beyond these games, because I think the profile of women in sport is very important. Now, um, on a couple of other aspects, the, uh, we've been working very hard through the Active Girls programme that Sports Scotland run to particularly keep uh, teenage girls active, because we know that that is uh, a big challenge. And more broadly, the working group on women in sport that uh, Baroness Sue Campbell is chairing uh, for me is going to report in the next few weeks uh, about how we can support and improve the position of women in sport and indeed encourage more female participation in sport. So I very much look forward uh, to her recommendations and then taking those forward. Hansal Malik, followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. Um, very enlightened with the Minister's statement this afternoon and Patricia's follow-up of that. I think it's fantastic that what we've achieved, um, and I would like to see a lot more of what we've already achieved to continue. Um, I, I do feel that we've perhaps missed out 
the phone office and all the embassies around the world, they, they gave us a great deal of support and help. And I know that for a fact when I was visiting Sri Lanka, and I wish to add my thanks to them as well. And I also want, wish to ask the minister, what else could she do to help and support the minority communities take more part in sporting activities in Scotland? Uh, can I also um, agree with Hans Malik that the, um, the embassies provided a very important support to the Queen's Baton really on its international leg um, and through our own agencies who worked very closely with them to make uh, sure that, that Scotland was uh, promoted uh, and the opportunities uh, um, on the international stage uh, were very important uh, to us when the Queen's Baton really was on its journey. In terms of encouraging um, uh, people from various communities into sport. Uh, a lot of work has been done around breaking down barriers. Sport Scotland have been working very closely with governing bodies and clubs to make sure that they are uh, open to everyone and that barriers, whether that's physical barriers or attitudinal barriers, uh, are, re are, are removed so that everyone uh, can take uh, part in sport. The hubs, the 150 plus community sports hubs that are well on their way to being delivered, I think provide an opportunity within communities for people locally to access sport in a very straightforward, easy, simple way. And again, we've made it very clear that those hubs have to be open uh, to everyone. So we'll continue to uh, work around these issues and uh, I'd be very happy to speak to Hanzala Malik in more detail uh, about that at a later stage. John Mason, followed by Alice McKenna. Hey, thank you. And uh, can I thank the Minister, I think on behalf of Patricia Ferguson, myself, uh, and all the 15,000 Clydesiders uh, for her kind uh, words to us. Can she give any indication how she thinks uh, Clydesiders and other volunteers can be drawn into more regular volunteering uh, after the Games? Cabinet Secretary. Can I uh, thank John Mason uh, for his contribution as a Clyde Sider and uh, I hope he enjoyed uh, the experience. Uh, I'm sure he did. Uh, can I uh, say to, to, to John Mason that we have um, been very lucky in that when people registered to uh, become a volunteer, they uh, were asked to give permission for their information to be shared. That has provided a huge database to Volunteer Scotland, not just those who were successful in becoming Clydesiders, but those also who, who were not. And uh, I hope over the next few months we'll have a, a, a more detailed picture of how many people uh, continue uh, to volunteer, perhaps volunteer for the first time. Uh, within uh, their communities, um, because that is a, a resource that is a hu potentially huge for our local clubs and for sport within the community. And that's something that I'm very keen uh, to follow up on um, as a priority. Alice McInnes, followed by James Palmer. Thank you very much. And let me add my congratulations to all involved in delivering such a successful Games. The North East Zone, Hannah Miley, helped set the tone, winning the very first uh, gold medal of the 19 gold medals, and she did it in spectacular fashion. The talent and determination and ambition of each individual athlete needs to be matched, I think, by, by ambitious investment in coaching and training facilities. And the Aquatic Centre in Aberdeen is a good example of that ambition. And, and members might well remember Nicole Stevens' determination that it should be a 50-metre competition pool. But there are other sports less well-resourced. So looking forward, which sports does the Minister anticipate being nurtured and developed so that future medal halls are even excel the bounty that we had this year? Minister, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, well, first of all, Hannah Miley was absolutely fantastic and a great um, ambassador for, for sport and for, for women's sport in, in particular. Uh, she asked about coaching and investment in coaching and training facilities. I can tell her that Sports Scotland have invested a, an unprecedented level uh, of resource into both uh, coaching and uh, training and facilities um, over the course of the preparations uh, for these games. Obviously, a lot of the focus and additional investment was on the 17 Commonwealth Games uh, sports, but that didn't mean that other sports didn't get investment. They did, but perhaps not at uh, quite the, the same uh, level of intensity. Uh, what I can also tell her that uh, just a few weeks ago, the Sports Scotland announced a, a new £20 million region, regional and national uh, facilities fund, which will help to add to our fantastic world-class state-of-the-art facilities that we already have. And certain areas uh, have been uh, prioritised for that investment because it's recognised that they could uh, benefit from additional um, state-of-the-art performance 
facilities. So that, that programme will continue and um, I think we should be very pleased at where we're at compared to maybe 10, 15 years ago. You know, the, the facilities we have are second to none now and that's something we should make sure we fully utilise going forward into the future. James Donnan, followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, well, we're on the subject of congratulating people, I think that somebody that should be congratulated is uh, Stuart Maxwell, who played an important role in uh, the bid process to make sure that we won those games. I'm sure, like many others here, uh, remember the day in Fruit Market when uh, the result came through on a big screen, which was a, a day I remember, although I wish I had been over carrying his bag when I worked on him at the time. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about legacy here, and the, the, it's great the games will bring a, la a lasting legacy, not just to Glasgow, but to Scotland as a whole. But there are also a number of local organisations working to deliver a legacy out with Scotland, such as Cathcartle Parish Church in my constituency, who are involved in Hit the Net programme to help protect children from malaria, and they've used the Commonwealth Games particularly well to raise funds for that prospect. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline to me what impact she expects the Glasgow Games to have as a legacy on the rest of the Commonwealth? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, can I, can I thank uh, James Dornan for um, recognising um, and uh, um, allowing me to recognise Stuart Maxwell's very important contribution. Um, I suppose it's that thing, where, as I said in my, my statement, um, when you start listing uh, people, there's, uh, there's always some that you, you name and some that you don't. But absolutely, uh, Stuart Maxwell's contribution was absolutely critical in taking forward. In fact, when I uh, took over the sports portfolio in 2009, uh, the work he had done before made my job uh, a lot easier in taking that forward. In terms of uh, James Dornan's uh, comments about the uh, some of the work going on in his constituency, first of all, to pay tribute to all of that legacy work and the, the events that were put in uh, place by so many local organisations. I think they really added to the flavour um, of those games. In terms of the, what uh, I would expect the games to uh, have uh, by way of impact on the rest of the Commonwealth, there are a number of programmes that I think will leave a lasting legacy. The Game on Scotland programme, the education programme, has developed a lot of links between schools here in Scotland and schools across the, the Commonwealth, uh, which is something we should be very pleased about. The UNICEF partnership, which has raised £5 million, will allow work to take place now in all Commonwealth countries around uh, children's rights. Um, the 3350 Commonwealth Youth Leadership Programme, again, is a programme that we would like to see uh, continue and are going to be obviously encouraging the Gold Coast uh, to look at that as a, a legacy programme uh, going forward. Um, so, you know, we have a, a huge number of opportunities to uh, keep the, that work going uh, across the Commonwealth, and I'll certainly be looking to do that where I can. Elaine Murray, followed by Bonnie Watt. Can you please be brief? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Commonwealth Games was indeed a fantastic su success, which I'm sure will inspire young people to get involved and produce future generations of elite athletes. However, I'd like to ask the, cab the Cabinet Secretary for her views on how the success of the Games can be used to encourage those of us who are old enough to realise we will never be a Usain Bolt or an Ailey Childs or a Hanny Miley to become more active more often. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, never say never. Um, can I say that Elaine Murray makes an important point because although um, you know, the focus has been on young people and a lot of the capacity that's been created in the clubs for that expected uh, upsurge, which we know will come when people are inspired by all of those fantastic athletes to take up a sport, maybe for the first time, um, but it won't just be young people doing that. And I suspect that we'll see uh, uh, people of all ages uh, taking up the opportunity to try uh, new sports, um, particularly those that have been uh, a focal point within these games. Beyond that, we have been uh, continuing to fund really great programmes through Legacy, like Paths for All, because we know that walking can be um, a really important way of getting people uh, healthy who perhaps have had quite a sedentary lifestyle. And the, you know, the average uh, age for Pass for All tends to be perhaps the kind of 50 plus, but uh, great feedback uh, in terms of the health impact and the social impact of that programme as well. And hopefully Thursday will give us an opportunity to explore some of that in more detail. Finally, Maureen Mock, can you keep it brief, please? 
Uh, yes, the Cabinet Secretary rightly recognised the huge contribution that the volunteers made, some working 48-hour weeks and some working many weeks before and still working uh, at the village, for example, some getting up at 3.30 as one volunteer from the presiding officer's constituency did, getting up at 3.30 a.m. to make the 7 a.m. start. And I wonder whether she could find a way of having that recognised and enhancing their employment prospects by sending an email to those who want it, confirming their contribution and commitment uh, to strengthen their future CVs. I am pleased to be able to uh, tell them, the member that um, each volunteer will receive a certificate of achievement which is recognised by SQA and will um, list the skills and uh, attributes of each volunteer and particularly achievements that they have gained throughout their, the experience of volunteering at the Games. In addition to that, they will receive information on next step options and uh, last but not least, a thank you letter from the First Minister. Thank you very much. I pass on my apologies to the three members I simply couldn't call today, but we need to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10712 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on Scotland and Malawi, a special relationship. I call on Hamza Yousaf to speak to and move the motion. Minister, I can give you 10 minutes. Thank you, officer. Uh, I very much... Uh welcome the opportunity to highlight the special relationship that exists between Scotland and Malawi. I uh, thank everyone for uh, attending the debate. I know uh, how important that relationship is to members across the Chamber of all uh, political persuasions uh, and none. It shows a real commitment and belief in the relationship between our two countries. The timing of the debate is particularly appropriate given the next round of the Malawi Development Fund uh, that opened this morning. Uh, I've been asked, uh, I was very involved, the presiding officer, in the Games as well as members of, of, across the chamber, and I was asked constantly throughout my time in Glasgow, the 11 days, what was my favourite part of the opening ceremony? Was it the Iron Brew holding up the, the bridge? Was it uh, dancing tonics, tea cakes? Was it Nessie? It's a particular interest to our foreign dignitaries. Um, uh, but my favourite moment, all of that was great, of course, uh, but my favourite moment by far it was the fact that Glasgow and our opening ceremony became the first opening ceremony ever to raise money for, or for, or for children across the Commonwealth, some of the poorest children across the Commonwealth. Um, I think that first, that first uh, overshadows all the other firsts that perhaps uh, we've had as a great city and as a, as a, as a great country. Uh, but that highlighted, and the reason why people took such pride in it, obviously it was a great uh, initiative nonetheless to take pride in, but inherently we feel as Glaswegians, I think as Scots as well, of course, that we have a responsibility to show our compassion uh, on, the, on, on the world stage. And um, I was pleased that uh, that was a standout moment for many, uh, many people. 2014 has been also a momentous year for Malawi. And uh, I was delighted to uh, have the opportunity in January to take the Queen's baton uh, over to Malawi as it arrived during its journey uh, across the Commonwealth. I uh, represented Scotland on its uh, welcome uh, to Lalongwe. Uh, in May, Malawi also, uh, is a momentous year because in May uh, of this year, uh, Malawi held its first ever tripartite elections. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate the people uh, of Malawi on those peaceful and stable elections. We welcome the new government in Malawi and the Scottish government, and I think probably the whole chamber, no doubt, in the parliament, looks forward to working with the new government, new parliamentarians, uh, for the the, the mutual uh, good of both our countries. In his inaugural speech, which I read in, in, in great detail, President Professor Peter Matarika spoke of Malawi being a young democracy, uh, but also a country known for its political tolerance. He highlighted to his fellow Malawians that they have begun another leg of 50 years and that the next 50 years of their journey presents uh, Malawi with an opportunity to reset its priorities, rethink its strategic focus, redefine Malawi as it makes progress. We want to continue to support the Malawian government and its people in that second leg of its journey. On the 6th of July uh, of this year, again, Malawi celebrated 50 years or anniversary of its independence. I was delighted to attend the Scottish celebrations organised uh, largely by the Scottish-Malawi Partnership uh, in Glasgow, uh, also attended by Lord McConnell and people of, across the political spectrum. It had a real uh, Malawian feel to it and affirmed that special and warm relationship uh, between Malawi uh, and Scotland. Uh, diplomatic uh, protocol and, uh, and friendliness would not dictate me to tell you the score of the match between myself and the Malawian High Commissioner at the table tennis, but fair to say I won. Um, Scotland is... Uh, <laughs> indeed shameless. 
Uh, Scotland is an active player uh, in the international development world that reflects our historic outward-facing relationship with the world and our desire to be a good global citizen. I spoke uh, during the Commonwealth Games of some of the more uh, unsavoury parts of our history as Scots, in terms of uh, Glasgow being the second city of the empire at the fantastic Empire Cafe. And there was a discussion at that uh, moment that actually, uh, for all the negative uh, aspects uh, of, our, of our history, that, uh, you know, notwithstanding, we have a real responsibility to the poorest. And for all those that were slave owners, actually, uh, we had, of course, in Scotland, some of the greatest abolitionists. And one of those, of course, being Dr. David Livingstone, who took his journey to explore the Zambezi uh, and uh, took education uh, to, to Malawi and helped to establish the ed educational infrastructure. Uh, this Scottish Government has continued to commit to providing at least £3 million pounds per year from a £9 million pounds international development uh, budget. At present, we fund 40 projects, uh, straddling all four strands of the 2005 cooperation agreement. Uh, and, uh, I had the also privilege uh, during the Commonwealth Games of meeting uh, the newly appointed three weeks into post uh, Minister for Youth uh, and Sport of the Commonwealth Games, the Honourable uh, Grace uh, Obama Chayumia. And she described our relationship uh, as one of sisters, uh, like a family. And like families, uh, we also played and competed together during the Games as well. I was there, as was the Cabinet Secretary at the Scotland versus uh, Malawi uh, netball game. Uh, and for being our sisters, I have to say, they beat us pretty thoroughly, uh, one has to confess. And the Cabinet Secretary was a former netball player, was ready to get our trainers on. But uh, anyway, time did not allow uh, that to be the case. In terms of my visit to, to Malawi uh, during the Queen's Battle, really, uh, it, was a, it was a phenomenal pleasure because I got to see firsthand the impact our international development projects are having on the ground. And it's an enormous privilege to do that. Not everybody gets to see how, how that money is being spent. And there's many who will question why we choose to spend the money at those projects. But having seen them firsthand, I can attest to the impact they're making. And although we have a modest budget, that's one I know that we're all very, very proud of, uh, the impact it's having is quite unbelievable. When I was seeing the MREAP project, our uh, renewables acceleration uh, initiative that we have in Malawi, I was being shown uh, one of the projects that are near the Melangi Mountain. And uh, I was told about uh, how our micro hydroelectric scheme that we were helping to fund and develop, how that had made, uh, that had allowed uh, a woman, the first woman in this village near the mountain, to be the first woman in her village to give birth in a room with a light in it. Unbelievable. 21st century, thinking about how many lights we have and how much light and energy we have. She was the first woman in her village to give birth in light. Uh, I visited Anne Glogue's uh, fistula hospital, which she set up, and which uh, we're helping to fund a project there. And fistula, uh, many people here are, are aware of, but uh, women walking uh, heavily pregnant uh, in labour, about to go into labour imminently, having to walk up to 20 or 30 kilometres. Uh, unfortunately, then, uh, the, the baby being born, stillborn, uh, the fistula, uh, leaving the women often incontinent, uh, and needing in repair. These were women who were then being outcast in their communities, sometimes even divorced by their uh, husbands. Uh, but through the fistula hospital and the initiatives that we were funding, not only was fistula repaired, giving them a better quality of life, but we were also funding uh, some uh, solar powered uh, batteries, which they could then use as an income generator for others to come here to charge the telephone or whatever it is they wanted to charge. So these women were going from outcasts to being leaders of business uh, in their community as well. As well as the maternal health side, uh, of course, also, and, and, and the renewable side, also very pleased about what we're doing in regards to sustainable economic development as well, because we believe very much that, of course, as important and imperative our aid is, uh, we also want to ensure that we can help Malawians to create local wealth uh, local business, local jobs to lift themselves uh, out of poverty. That's why I'm delighted to meet representatives of Opportunity International Bank in Malawi that we've uh, funded before uh, for their micro loan uh, initiative and projects. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, in my opening uh, earlier remarks, uh, presiding officer, that education has always figured strongly in Scotland's relationship with Malawi and uh, uh, still does to this day in terms of the Church of Scotland, the education that it provides. I'm delighted that uh, we provided funding for 37 uh, uh, gifted uh, and underprivileged Malawians to study master's degrees in Malawi as part of the Livingston Bicentenary celebrations. Uh, but that is, again, to keep that local knowledge and those local skills within Malawi. Uh, we are going to be working hard to develop capacity and sustainability in the Malawian education 
system. Uh, Education Scotland uh, were there with me in Malawi when I was there with the, the Queen's Baton really and signed an agreement with their uh, counterparts in Malawi in terms of the inspection system uh, for Malawian schools so we can help to drive up uh, standards. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, members again that the first of the Malawian triennial funding rounds has opened uh, earlier today. We'll look to distribute £13 million over that uh, period. I look forward very much to receiving those applications. Uh, in terms of giving thanks, uh, this relationship I noticed from the first week uh, I was in the job that it spans the length and breadth of the country uh, and also, uh, also all sectors of society, from nurses to teachers to faith groups and everybody else. So let me put on record my thanks to groups such as the Scottish Malawi Partnership, the sister organisation, the Malawi Scotland Partnership, uh, NIDOS, and many, 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 many others who are involved in uh, supporting the aims of the, the government's international development policy. Uh, I will look forward to listening to the debate as it unfolds in terms of the uh, amendments coming forward. I look forward to accepting them in the spirit of the consensus and collaborative approach that we have uh, and, uh, on this issue uh, of Malawi. But I look forward to listening to the debate and participating in it as it unfolds. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to speak to and move Amendment 107.12.1. Maximum seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in my name. It is a pleasure to speak again about Malawi in the Chamber and to consider our shared commitment to that country. But in passing, I would just uh, say that I wholeheartedly agree with the Minister and his comments about the involvement of UNICEF in the Commonwealth Games. Uh, I thought that initiative was amazing, frankly, and the kind of thing that you wonder why we haven't done that before, the opportunity of that captive audience both there in the stadium and at home is just too good an opportunity to miss. And I had the, the pleasure of hearing the UNICEF ambassador, Sir Roger Moore, speak very movingly and very knowledgeably about his commitment to the cause and also about how UNICEF plans to take forward the work that it will do with that money. And for anyone who views people like Sir Roger as the caricature that we sometimes see from Bond films, etc., I can say that the Sir Roger Moore we heard speaking before the opening ceremony of the Games was a different person entirely and someone who I could have listened to, frankly, all night, but then I would have missed the opening ceremony, so that probably wouldn't have been so good. Um, but while the initiative to support Malawi was begun by a Labour and Liberal Democrat coalition government, it has over the years been a source of some pride in our parliament that we have been able to come together in our support for Malawi and for international development, recognising that whatever our circumstances, the plight of people in Malawi and in other countries is still of such concern that we will work above and across the political divide to provide assistance where we can. In our schools and colleges and in our churches and community organisations, people from a diverse range of backgrounds and interests come together to support our brothers and sisters in Malawi and they expect no less of us. That's why I was delighted last week that during the Commonwealth Games the Minister was part of a photo call with the Malawi and Scottish basketball teams following their match. The coming together of two teams who had just battled it out on the court, but who could then come together to recognise the partnership our two countries enjoy, seemed to me to be a very good symbol of that work. I was only sorry that my volunteer pass didn't give me access to the venue so that I could come along and cheer the Minister and both teams on. But the recent report produced by the University of Edinburgh for the Scotland-Malawi partnership identified just how effective that work in Malawi over the years has been. Estimates contained in that report would suggest that approximately 2 million Malawians have benefited directly from the activities of SNP members, with many more benefiting indirectly. The report suggests the figure may be as high as 4 million affected by work undertaken by Scottish Malawi Partnership members. But of course, the relationship isn't a one-way street, with some 300,000 Scots estimated to have benefited indirectly from those inputs. And I think it's important to remember that it is a two-way relationship. Now, we will all know of examples from our own constituencies and regions, not least because half of Scotland's local authorities are members of the Scotland-Malawi Partnership and involved in that vital work. And my own local authority in Glasgow is particularly active and the Lord Provost has a special fund which is used to support education, water, health and sanitation projects in Malawi. 
and City Building, the arm's length construction and maintenance organisation, which happens to be based in my constituency, has built two prosthetic and orthotic clinics at the Longway General Hospital in partnership with the charity 500 Miles. It's refurbished part of the former town hall in the Longway to transform it into a public health clinic, including an opticians and a dental suite. And they have also built an, an HIV AIDS clinic at Chikawa District Hospital. Each of these facilities making a real difference to the lives of local people in those areas. And of course, perhaps the most inspiring of them all, Glasgow City Council runs the Malawi Leaders of Learning programme with Malawi's South West Division. This project delivers new school facilities, but also encourages young students and teachers from Glasgow schools to work in Malawi, teaching and learning with their Malawian counterparts. Springburn Academy has been involved in this work, and it's been a real pleasure to hear the students talk about their experiences. This year's awards ceremony featured a presentation from a group of pupils who had just returned from Malawi, and it was nothing less than inspiring to hear their accounts of their time there, and also to see how proud they were of their achievements and the confidence it had given them as they talked about what they had done and the new friends they had made. I have no doubt that the benefit was not just to the young people and the teachers in Malawi they worked with, but also to them themselves and to that wider school community in Springburn. But of course, all of this work is underpinned by the Millennium Development Goals, about which my colleague Siobhan McMahon will say more in closing. And as the Chamber will have noted, the Scottish Labour Amendment also talks about the work being done by the Scottish Government, complementing that of DFID. Now, I think that this is vitally important if we are to avoid duplication of effort and maximise effectiveness. After all, both governments are working with the interests of Malawi at heart. So it's important that they learn from one another and regularly discuss and develop partnerships wherever and whenever it makes sense to do so. DFID may perhaps have the expertise and reach that Scotland doesn't have or the Scottish Government doesn't have, but similarly I think DFID could learn from the approach that the Scottish Government has taken over time to develop projects on the ground working with the Malawi Government identifying what their priorities actually are. But of course we must also remember the many, many organisations throughout Scotland who work in Malawi day in and day out, too numerous to mention, Skiaf, Mary's Meals and a host of others. But I would also particularly like to mention Amnesty International because I think they do a very difficult job. They remind us that we have to be a critical friend of Malawi, that there are issues that we must take the opportunity when it's appropriate to raise with the Malawi government. Issues like the anti-homosexuality laws that apply and issues like the death penalty still being enforced in Malawi, even though it's not often used these days, thankfully. So I think we have to be that critical friend and we have to take that opportunity and raise these vital issues too when the opportunity arises. In closing, Presiding Officer, I'd just like to applaud all the many groups and organisations and individuals throughout our country who are involved with Malawi and hope that they will continue their involvement for a very long time to come. Many thanks. And I now call on Mudra Fraser to speak to and move Amendment 10712.2. Uh, five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, warmly welcoming uh, this uh, debate and declaring my interest as a member of the Scotland Malawi partnership. And like uh, other members in the chamber, I had the privilege of visiting uh, Malawi on a parliamentary visit uh, some years ago. Uh, and just as uh, the minister said in relation to his own visits, those who visit us there, visit there and see the, the projects that have been supported by uh, the Scottish government's spend cannot uh, but come away impressed and deeply moved at the difference that is making to people's lives. There are three aspects of the support for Malawi I'd like to touch on. The first is obviously the, the Scottish government's programme. Uh, as the Minister accepted, this started in, in 2005. It's been continued and developed by successive Scottish governments and is extremely welcome and, as I said, does make a huge difference on the ground. The second is the civic engagement that uh, Patricia Ferguson has just talked about and, indeed, the Minister referred to as well. I think we're all aware of a range of uh, charities, uh, schools, church groups across Scotland in all of our constituencies and regions which are helping in Malawi. And of course, government does have a role here, and government plays a key role. But the support from broader Scotland goes way beyond what comes from government um, and is of huge value. Uh, and I know it uh, makes uh, a tremendous difference to the lives 
of uh, millions of Malawians. And the third aspect of it, and this is what I touched on in my amendment, is that we can't talk about the support for Malawi without also making reference to the support that we in Scotland give through the United Kingdom and through uh, the role of DFID, which in 2014-15 uh, amounts to some £90 million pounds to Malawi, supporting education, health care and food assistance. And the UK is one of only five uh, countries internationally meeting the target of 0.7% of gross national income to international development and humanitar humanitarian uh, causes. And I think that's very welcome. And I noticed uh, from Scotland-Malawi partnership how they welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is working in hand with the UK Government in delivering this. And we know we have a special relationship with Malawi here in Scotland. In fact, you only had to watch the opening ceremony of the uh, uh, Commonwealth Games to see the rapturous welcome the Malawian team got when they entered Celtic Park to know that there is a special affection here in Scotland for Malawi. Now, the Minister raised what is a very important issue, which is the question of uh, Scotland's uh, and indeed the UK's legacy in uh, many of our uh, former uh, colonial parts of the country. And, and of course, there are dark periods there. I thought it was interesting at the time of the Commonwealth Games, there was a poll published that said that 49% of people in the UK said they thought the British Empire left a generally positive legacy. 15% disagreed. What struck me when I visited Malawi was just how positively our influence was viewed. And the Minister is talking about David Livingstone, who perhaps is the Scottish figure who has the most resonance and most influence in Malawi uh, in terms of its history. And David Livingstone, of course, went to Malawi not to, not to conquer, not to exploit, not to enslave the people, but he went there to bring freedom. He went as a liberator. And his self-confessed objective was to open up Central Africa to Christianity and to commerce. And commerce was to him so important because that was the way to defeat the slave trade. And he spent much of his life uh, not actually engaged in missionary work, but he spent much of his life in exploration trying to open up trade routes east to west across Africa so Central Africa uh, could be uh, available then to trade with the rest of the world and he saw that being the way to build a local economy that would not then be dependent upon the slave trade and that was the way to stamp that out. And if you go to Malawi today it strikes you that, that those twin objectives, ending the slave trade, introducing Christianity, are what makes David Livingston so important to Malawians today and of course Malawi today is a very uh, Christian country as anybody who's been there would testify. It's also a great role we can play in helping strengthen democracy. I mentioned in my amendment the question of good uh, governance. The minister uh, reminded us there's a, a new parliament being elected uh, in Malawi. This parliament's played an important role in twinning with uh, members in the Malawian parliament, helping them strengthen their roles. There's a particular role to be played, I think, in helping members of the opposition in holding government to account. Maybe that could also happen the other way around, but we'll leave that debate for another day. But Politics in Malawi is rather different from what we have in our country. They don't have party politics in the way that we do. Political parties tend to be based around regional or tribal groupings or around the personality of a leader. And that makes it a different environment for parliamentarians to operate. And I think there's a lot we can try and help them with in terms of strengthening parliament as an institution and helping them hold government to account. I'm out of time, Thank Deputy Planning Officer. Can I just say, uh, in closing, I don't, I don't think anyone who visits Malawi can can come away, but with a very strong impression, first of all, of the deep affection for Scotland and of the importance in which they hold the continuing ties that we continue to develop. So I'm happy to applaud the Scottish Government's ongoing support, and I am happy to move my amendment. Many thanks. We turn to the open debate. Can I remind members who wish to speak in it to press the request to speak buttons? Um, we are quite tight for time this afternoon. Speeches of four minutes maximum. Maureen Watt to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate the Minister for initiating this debate today. It's not only timely because Malawi has just celebrated 50 years of independence, but also because of the many recent meetings that have been between the two countries uh, during the Commonwealth Games. In relation to Malawi's milestone in celebrating 50 years of independence, I'd like to thank all those who signed the motion I lodged in relation to this, particularly Alec Ferguson, Jackie Bailey and Richard Simpson, the only members of the opposition parties to recognise the significance of this date. They didn't immediately hit the delete button when they saw the word independence. 
not being able to se separate the wood from the tree springs to mind in relation to their colleagues, but the motion is still live, and as an optimist, I hope that others will still sign it. I was pleased to be able to attend the independence celebrations at Whiteinch Community Centre on the 12th of July, where Malawians and friends of Malawi gathered for an afternoon of speeches, good food, drink and music. I was particularly pleased that there were two busloads of uh, Malawians from Aberdeen there, and even people who'd come up from the southeast of England to take part in the festivities in Scotland, as there was nothing comparable in their own areas. I think the event was much appreciated by all, and I thank the organisers and the Scotland-Malawi Partnership for ro their role in making the event a huge success. The participants were particularly pleased to see the minister there and for him to announce uh, that a further round of uh, the Mal Scottish Government Malawi Development Fund uh, was going to be opened and to, uh, people could bid for new projects in Malawi. I was pleased to meet up there with uh, Robert Callan from Strathclyde University who's involved in a number of projects relating to providing clean water. And I think it's time we had him back to the cross-party group to have an update on the impact that that work is having. I thank the Minister for taking the time to meet with the new Minister of Youth, Sport and Culture during the Games. I, knew, I know she and the High Commissioner much appreciated the meeting. The new Minister, as um, Amza Youssef mentioned, is the Honourable Grace Chamia who since 2010 has been my peer through this Parliament's Parliamentary Pairing Initiative with the Malawi Parliament. I'm very proud of her achievement, not least that she was one of, I think, only four women returned to the Malawi Parliament after the elections, and that is despite there having been substantial efforts to ensure maximum retention of women MPs. Uh, and encouragement of more, but sadly there are fewer women in this parliament than the previous one. Uh, I hope her meeting with Shona Robertson also went ahead, um, despite her being uh, held up in traffic. I know while she was there, she was avidly supporting Malawi's netball team, which um, is ranked one of the highest uh, in the world. She's a keen netball player herself, and indeed the Malawi parliament have a netball team of its own, having played against the uh, Kenyan parliament. And if the <laughs> cabinet secretary for culture was uh, a previous netball player, I was too. Maybe we've got the beginnings of a team here. <laughs> Uh, but I'm sure uh, the Honourable Grace Chamia will be an excellent minister. She's certainly given me much to do in gathering information to send her. Presiding officer, I know there's not much time in this debate, but Scotland's relationship with Malawi is a very special one, making a real difference to the lives of people in Malawi and to those in Scotland involved with Malawi. I hope this relationship is strengthened and deepened as we go forward. I support the motion. Many thanks. And to now call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome that this is our first debate uh, back from the recess, immediately coming as it does after the Commonwealth Games. And I do think it's important that we are celebrating the relationship that we have with Malawi. It is a special relationship. Its existence over the last decade has, I believe, enriched both countries, whether it's on a government-to-government, parliament-to-parliament or people-to-people -people relationship, because all of these relationships are crucial. Um, and I strongly support the Labour Amendment because it gives extra emphasis to the connections we are building people-to-people, -people, because I think they are absolutely vital. That's not to say that government to government isn't important. And I think if you look at the development programme and the development of links between the two governments over the last decade, I think they're absolutely vital. The initial links in health and education, absolutely crucial in terms of um, our contribution to reducing uh, maternal mortality, um, the HIV uh, uh, levels of infection that there are in Malawi and the challenge of expanding and improving educational opportunity, particularly for young girls, but also I think as time goes on, thinking not just about primary school but about secondary school and then on to further and higher education. Those initial um, key areas of work I think have enabled 
a large number of NGOs and community organisations to come in with and build on the Scottish Government's work, but also to add their own contributions. I think the work that's being done on climate change and renewables is also important. And if I could just add the, the crucial importance of agriculture to Malawi, um, when we were the last day on our visit, the issue of rampant inflation was a key issue for the economy, and access to fertilisers um, was something that all the Malawian community groups in relation to farming were very concerned about. Um, but there's research on climate change, there's a huge raft of work that needs yet to be done on water quality, and one of the lessons that came from our um, last visit was it's not just enough to put in infrastructure, you need trained local people with the skills and the knowledge and the resources to keep that infrastructure working. There's nothing worse in a developing country than a broken water feature because that's a tantalising feature. It shows you what might have been, what could have been, but not what is. So I think the chance to share knowledge and skills and promote sustainable development is absolutely crucial. And I think the Minister's point about enabling Malawi's economy to grow is right. And again, there's more that we can do in terms of civic participation through fair trade, through the cooperative movement, to enable some of the smallest communities and actually some of the most isolated communities in Malawi to be successful. The parliament-to-parliament -parliament relationship is important too, and it was briefly mentioned by uh, Myrtle Fraser. Um, the sharing of best practice, I don't think people in uh, Scotland should underestimate the importance of that. The foundation of our own parliament was done on the basis of accountability and transparency and equality, and the knowledge that we were building on other institutions' best practice. So it's not that I think we say we are the only way or the best way to do everything, but here's the experience we have for good or ill. Here's what's worked, here's what hasn't worked. In the last visit that Alex Ferguson and I did, a large part of our work was sharing our experiences, particularly in audit, particularly in holding government ministers to account. And a successful parliamentary democracy does need effective opposition. And it's very interesting visiting a country um, which is a developing democracy. And again, it's not about imposing what we do and how we do it, but it's opening up that discussion and opening up um, a debate about how best to hold the government to account. But I kind of want to finish on the people-to-people -people link because I think that's the element that's in Patricia Ferguson's amendment, which I think is absolutely crucial. And it's the people-to-people -people link that I think most of us actually get very excited about. The numbers, the huge numbers of people in our community, well recorded by the Scotland-Malawi partnership, that are involved in day-to-day organisational campaigning, volunteering, community solidarity, and support for some of the world's poorest and most disadvantaged communities. I'm afraid you need to close, please. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Dr Richard Sims. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. It's uh, been said of uh, Malawi that it's the warm heart of Africa. And uh, what better uh, country could we seek to have a relationship with? I want to just pick up uh, some of the things that Sarah Boyack said in relation to agriculture uh, and highlight some of the great challenges we are imposing on countries like Malawi and perhaps Malawi in particular in our Western developed world. Malawi, two thirds of Malawi's exports are tobacco. We quite rightly are seeking to remove tobacco as a, a major part of our society for the health uh, of people in our country and other countries are doing the same. But when we do that, that will have a significant effect on the economy of a country like Malawi, where two thirds of the exports are tobacco based. So we owe a duty to countries like Malawi to help them cross to a more beneficial uh, mode of agriculture. They're essentially self-sufficient in food uh, for themselves, but we're already seeing some danger that tobacco farmers in the face of lowering profits are moving across to grow cannabis. And that's not going to be helpful in the long term for people in desperate need in countries like uh, Malawi. Climate change is also making agriculture a more formidable challenge in many countries in Africa as well. And we are largely responsible in the developed world for that. So we need to make sure that we are supporting 
uh, people in Malawi. We're already doing so. We have a number of programs that we're supporting there. And of course, I've said before in this place, climate change in Africa in particular has a gender bias in that it differentially affects women over men because women are generally those who are homemakers and the agronomists while the men sit round uh, the village uh, table discussing the state of world affairs, the women are doing the actual work. Walking further to get water, getting less for their efforts from the soil as a result of climate change. So I very much welcome the initiative that the previous administration here took to build effective relationships with Malawi and that continues to be sustained by the present government. Now, we have a number of relationships with uh, Malawi. Uh, Hastings Banda, who was born in about 1898, uh, came to Edinburgh uh, to convert his medical qualification to one that was acceptable uh, here in the UK. In 1941, Edinburgh University awarded him three separate awards. Um, my father actually knew him because my father was studying medicine and was in some of the same classes at the same time. I don't necessarily hold up Hastings Banda's contribution to Malawi as one of unalloyed success, but he did at least uh, start that country off. And of course, let's also remember many of the boundaries in Africa were arbitrarily imposed by colonialists, and we share some of the blame there. But one of the great things that's happening in Malawi is that a sense of adherence to that country, artificial as it was in its genesis, is clearly being reflected in public uh, life today. A democracy can be tested in a very simple way. A democracy exists if a government allows itself to be removed from office by a ballot of its people. And Malawi has passed that fundamental test. And that's something uh, we very much should welcome. I welcome what both the opposition parties say in their amendments. I don't know what the government's position is going to be, but each of them contain merit. Malawi is an important friend of ours. Let us be an ever important friend of Malawi. Many thanks. I now call on Richard Simpson to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to concentrate mainly on health issues because Malawi does have an average life expectancy of 38 years, reflecting some of the world's highest rates for infant and maternal mortality, malnutrition and infectious diseases. Currently, only 51% of the 14.9 million population has access to good sanitation. 47% of the children under five are stunted. One in 36 pregnant women die from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. And HIV and AIDS, which is prevalent throughout Africa, uh, is at a level of 10.8%. And despite these dire health statistics, the country is one of the lowest number of doctors per capita, one per 50,000. Now, international epidemiological studies also suggest that the rates of mental illness in Malawi are at least as high as those in Western countries. The mental health provision is, to say the least, extremely sparse. There's actually only one state psychiatrist, Dr. Felix Cow. The Scottish Malawi Mental Health Education Project charity is a good example of Scots working together with Malawians. Currently, the project delivers the teaching of psychiatry model module to medical students, supports postgraduate psychiatric trainees, delivers training to psychiatric nurses and clinical officers based in Zomba, Mental Hospital and the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, and they help organize the annual mental health conference attended by delegates from most of Sub-Saharan Africa, the UK, Europe, and USA. And this is a good example of a project receiving multiple support from the College of Psychiatrists, the Scottish Government, the NHS Education Trust Scotland, Tropical Health Education Trust, and local postgraduate deaneries and tutors. The other big topic, of course, is uh, tackling infectious diseases, and particularly pneumonia and diarrhea, where over the past decade, Malawi has made significant progress in reducing the deaths in children under five. But still, pneumonia is a big killer, taking the lives of a thousand babies a year, uh, babies and young children uh, in 2010. Diarrhea, another factor, causing the deaths of about 600 children per year. Now, no single intervention can affect be effective uh, in the treatment of control of either condition. But the good news is that Malawi is beginning to reduce the infections and deaths from these two previously stubborn killers. 
uh, using multiple actions, of which vaccines against pneumococcal bacteria and rotavirus are two of the newest tools and are now part of the regular routine childhood vaccination schedule. Uh, as Patricia Ferguson said, it's important that the government here work in partnership with the Department for International Development, uh, whose expenditure is £117 million in Malawi, uh, and working with them in their programme on education, health, agriculture, water and sanitation, with an emphasis on the rights of girls and women, I think is clearly important and I think accepted. Uh, Presiding officer, I briefly want to finish on a particular community, Dumblain. In your last minute. Who are uh, working in the uh, Likabula partnership, an example of how one community connects at many different levels with another, begun by the Dumblain Cathedral connecting to a church guild at CCAP Church, and from these initial church links spreading throughout the Dumblain community to include Dumblain High School and many other groups. Uh, they now support bursaries for the secondary school. They provide in the provision of clean water and sanitation. They work in partnership with Mary Meals to provide primary school meals there in a kitchen donated by Dumblain. And the Dumblain Rotary, uh, Bridge of Allen Dumblain Rotary, uh, working with the Anne Glogue Foundation, uh, support uh, the elimination of fistula, which is in the Freedom from Fistula uh, program. Now, it's these sort of multi-level connections and support involving the US, UK government, the Scottish government, various organisations in Scotland and communities that we can continue to foster the growing number of partnerships with, the Mal with Malawi. Many thanks. I now call on Christina McKelvey, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you very much, pres presiding officer. As a uh, young child, I was taken on a school visit, and I think maybe I've told this part of this story before, uh, to the David Livingston Centre in Blantyre. And as a 10-year-old who was reading ferociously at the time about all sorts of uh, interesting things around the world. To have that day with adventures across Africa um, pervading every part of my memory and getting me really interested. Some of the medical horror stories, I have never forgotten what Bill Harpsey is, and if anybody wants to know what it is, go and look it up. It's horrifying, but I was absolutely engrossed to the ending of slavery, to the romanticism of Livingston's body being carried across Africa for burial at Westminster Abbey, to the animals and the flowers and the fight with the lion and the jacaranda trees. These are all the things that engrossed me as a child in, in my uh, adventures in my head about going to Africa. And it takes me back to Hamilton, a part of my constituency, where at the United Reformed Church in Kent Street, which is the church of David Livingston and his family, they still have those very, very strong um, links to this day with David Livingston's family and Africa. And that takes me on to another adventure. And in 2008, I was very, very blessed to join the Westminster Foundation for Democracy on a visit to Malawi, which was to encourage women to stand in the elections. And we're delighted that some of the women that we know um, have been re-elected and are involved in, in, in government and politics there. Um, I'm equally delighted that the Scottish Government have announced the Scottish Government Development Fund to empower women in Malawi. Malawi. I think that's something that's very, very important to do and something that we've always had a commitment to anyway across all parties and, um, and none across the Chamber. Um, my travels took me from Lalongwe up to Nakata Bay. I s was able to see many, many projects of different funding models, but certainly some of the ones from the Scottish Government uh, obviously took my attention from the cassava growers to the sweet potato growers to the fish ponds that had been set up where you have these villages all set up in a proper true cooperative system um, trading and food um, creating jobs creating that commerce and that freedom from poverty that uh, Murdo Fraser spoke about in his contribution um, the trade between the villages was very interesting you know if it was a big fish or a big cassava pod you know they argued off whose was the best and whether there should be two pods to one fish or not. It was fantastic to see that type of um, commerce going on. Um, that takes me to uh, the Civic Scotland and the relationship that, that we continually to have with Malawi. In my travels in Malawi, I met school children at a number of primary schools who could tell me more about David Livingston, which was a bit of a feat because I was a bit of a fan um, uh, uh, of, of his... Um, uh, time in Malawi and Zambia and his time um, on uh, Lake um, Malawi and the work that he did there to open up that route with, with the ferries and boats and stuff. It's just amazing to see these wee kids who were taking all this on board. And one of the, the great things that we've got in here is the Scottish-Malawi partnership. Um, and last week they had a, a pop-up 
um, shop, basically, um, at the Commonwealth Games, um, where they uh, had a, all sorts of information about Scotland and uh, Malawi and the partnership that they have. Um, and they published a new report from Edinburgh University, where 94,000 Scots and 198,000 Malawians have been actively involved in building this amazing positive relationship. The Scottish Government International Development Grants are also very welcome because they keep this building that relationship. And it is, presiding officer, that positive, deep and long-lasting relationship that Scotland enjoys with Malawi. It's imperative that we nurture and grow it. It's imperative that we keep it going. But also that relationship with Malawi and all the other members of the family of nations proven that Scotland is indeed a good global citizen. Many thanks. And we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Jamie McGregor. Four minutes, please, Mr McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, this has been a very interesting debate with very good contributions from Richard Simpson on health matters, Stuart Stevenson on the history of Hastings Banda, and Christina McKelvey on the political elements, to name but a few. The Scottish Conservatives recognise and are proud of Scotland's strong and enduring historic links with Malawi, which began with the missionary work of the explorer David Livingstone, and we support the good work being undertaken in Malawi with Scottish Government funding through over 40 projects. We also recognise the scale of the challenges facing Malawi. As we've heard today, Malawi ranks 171st out of 187 in the UN Human Development Index. While Malawi has made some progress on its Millennium Development Goals, it's still unlikely to meet most targets. Poverty levels in Malawi remain at 51%, and despite many efforts have not registered a significant reduction since 2004, and rural poverty has increased to 56.6%, and as has income inequality. And there have been some welcome progress on under five and infant mortality, HIV treatment and access to water and sanitation, but maternal mortality remains high with 10 women dying every day. There are also the well-publicised concerns about governance, accountability and transparency in the country, which have led to some international donors, uh, countries, ceasing to fund projects directly through the Malaysian uh, government financial systems. Now, I agree with the Minister's um, uh, positive remarks and sentiments, and Patricia Ferguson, um, her remarks on, on UNICEF were very good, and I will remember Sir Roger Moore, I think he was Simon Templar in The Saint, and he is doing some saintly work for Malawi, along with many others. It's clear that Malawi is going to continue to need significant support, and that's why we're also proud of the work the UK Department for International Development is undertaking. As Murdo Fraser stated, it has committed uh, around 90 million funding this year alone as part of a package of support worth up to 360 million between 2011 and 2015. The UK is one of the world's most generous donor nations to Malawi. The UK government correctly wants to support wealth creation and economic growth in Malawi, and it's backing a new private sector development programme which will support agriculture diversification, and mentioned by Stuart Stevenson, and address financing constraints to growing businesses. Uh, another big part of Scotland's special relations with Malawi is the outstanding work done there by Scottish charity Mary's Meals. This is a local charity for me at home, based in Dalmally, my local village, and it's founded by my truly inspirational constituent, Magnus McFarlane Barrow. Mary's meal, Meals each day gives almost 690,000 children in Malawi a meal when they attend primary schools or under six centres. Mary's Meals' flagship programme began in Malawi in 2002, and they are investing five 0.36 million in Malawi this year alone, with around 75% of this spent on purchasing maize and soya from 20,000 smallholder farmers, providing a reliable income to thousands of families and multiplying the benefits of their programme throughout the country. This indeed is added value. Their programmes are based on strong partnerships with the school, the children, the local community who are responsible for delivering and managing their programmes, and the food is prepared and served by tens of thousands of community volunteers. School feeding is a recognised social safety net which encourages vulnerable, hungry children to enrol in and attend school. And by providing the meal, Mayor's Meal meets hungry children's immediate needs, and by encouraging them to go to school, it meets their long-term educational needs. And all of this is possible because of a massive grassroots movement of supporters in Scotland, which is also growing globally. 
Now, Sarah Boyack mentioned how important close, please. is the people-to-people -people element of Scottish-Malawi relationship, and I totally agree with her. The 20,000 active supporters of Mary's Meals in Scotland. In conclusion, presiding officer, we welcome today's debate, and we look forward to progress being made in Malawi, and I support the amendment in Murdo Fraser's name. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Siobhan McMahon at six minutes, please. Thank you. I'm pleased to take part in today's debate celebrating Scotland's relationship with Malawi and I welcome the Minister's funding announcement this afternoon. As the Minister knows, I have some reservations about how previous monies have been allocated by the Scottish Government and I know that he appreciates my concerns regarding this. I would hope that the concerns I have previously expressed will not become an issue this time and that all applications will be treated on their own individual merit. The debate this afternoon has been a good one. It has allowed us to once again talk about that special relationship we Scots have with our friends in Malawi. It has allowed some of us who have visited Malawi to talk about our experiences and memories that have shaped our vision of the country. Today's debate has also allowed members to talk about the local projects running in their areas, either church groups, schools or the many spheres of the voluntary sector. It is by sharing examples like these that we begin to understand just how strong our relationship with Malawi is. On Sunday, I attended my local parish, St Bernadette's and Motherwell for Mass. It was not unusual that the Mass was about Malawi, given that our parish is designated the first Sunday of every month as Malawi Sunday, meaning that there is always a display in the porch and prayers are offered for the country. What was unusual was that it was a Malawian priest taking the service. The Mass was said by the parish priest of St Anne's in Namalenga, Malawi. Both parishes have a formal partnership which was established last September following a visit to St Anne's Parish as part of a Classrooms for Malawi project by my parish priest, Father Stephen Reilly. My parish has now established a partnership team within our community and on a parish 50-50 club with a monthly draw to provide a stable income for that project. The local primary school of St Bernadette's have also established a link with St Anne's Primary and continue to learn from one another. That is just another example of the tremendous work ordinary people are doing on a daily basis to make sure that the relationship our country has with Malawi continues to go from strength to strength. In the previous debate in Malawi a few short months ago, I spoke about the conditions many female prisoners experience in the country. I spoke about Amnesty International concerns regarding the country's human rights record and asked that the Scottish Government press upon the Malawian Government that they have a lot more to do in terms of their human rights and equality record. As I stated in the previous debate, it is to be welcomed that both the Scottish and the UK governments give large amounts of funding to Malawi, but with that money there should be responsibility, and I can think of no greater area than this. Recently, St Margaret's High School in Airdrie was visited by a woman who had been freed from prison as a result of the actions of one of the school's pupils. Lauren Strain, during a visit to Malawi last June, paid for a lawyer for an unjustly convicted woman, resulting in her release from prison. The Malawian woman had been jailed after her son died from an infected wound received during a fight with his brother. Locked up in a rundown prison for her son's death, the woman gave birth to a girl on Christmas Day. After hearing her story, Lauren paid £40 for a lawyer and within a few days, the Malawian mother was released along with her newborn child. Lauren carried out that act not for praise, but because she could see the injustice of what is currently taking place in prisons across Malawi. That small act by Lauren has made a huge difference to that woman and her family, and we should be able to build on that. The elections in May of this year provide us this opportunity to start afresh in many areas and to re-establish some of the areas that we may not have been getting right previously. I hope that this is an opportunity the Scottish Government will seize. Members have also previously heard me speak about the fantastic work that Coatbridge Charity aiming higher in Malawi do. I will not reiterate many of the points I have previously mentioned in relation to them, However, I wanted to let the Chamber know of two projects the charity are currently undertaking and I hope that they will get the Scottish Government's support for their endeavours. Aiming higher in Malawi and St Margaret's High School have set up a Catholic women's cooperative in Makosa. This was a result of a meeting with a young HIV positive woman, Ruth Sampson, who was being sponsored by the St Margaret's pupils. Ruth was an outcast of the village, but through her relationship with the generous Scottish pupils who had visited Malawi a number of times over the years, the community was saved. Thanks to the fundraising efforts, Ruth now has a new house with a painting by a local Malawian artist on the side of it. As a result of the cooperative, the villagers have managed to grow enough crops to feed themselves and with a surplus left over to sell. The Scottish Catholic Observer have reported that when the Makosa women were asked to start at the start of the project, what was their greatest need? They asked for a shrine to praise God 
and decided to pray for their friends in Scotland every day for a year. Their faith, they said, had encouraged them to produce wonders and they extended their thanks and prayers to all their Scottish friends. The second project that Eamon Highland and Malawi have been working on with the help of North Lanarkshire Provost Jim Robertson is to help disabled children in the country. In my last speech, I spoke about the disadvantages disabled children face when growing up in Malawi. However, the Wheelchairs for Malawi programme supports children from the very poorest rural areas with proper medical assessment, the purchase and fitting of wheelchairs, prosthetics, footwear and crutches, and gives them the tools that will help them achieve their life's goals. In May this year, Jim Robertson held a gala dinner which raised over £20,000 for the project. But we can do more. I have already passed on the information DVD to the Minister about this project, and I hope that that is something he will look to throw his support behind. Finally, President Officer, the Global Millennium Development Goals are due to expire next year. The United Nations are currently negotiating the new framework. Although much progress has been made in recent years, the fact remains that one in eight people around the world continue to grow hungry each and every day. We have to make sure that the new framework tackles this statistic and makes it one that we never have to mention again. SCIAF have called for the new framework to have a coordinated international action with each and every state playing its part, not just those in the Global South. I hope that the Scottish Government will support such a framework and work with their colleagues in the UK Government to finally eradicate food poverty once and for all. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Humza Yousaf to wind up the debate. Uh, eight minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I know it's been a bit of a shorter debate uh, because of various statements and so on, but I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, thank all the members for their contributions uh, that they've made. It is one of those rare uh, topics, and I had the pleasure of introducing it to this Parliament a couple of times now, uh, Malawi, that brings everybody together, uh, regardless of political parties. And although they have, uh, of course, advice to give, and uh, quite rightly in terms of being a critical friend, uh, it's amazing that the whole chamber can come together and uh, praise each other in a giant loving which lasts at least an hour, uh, if not any longer than that. Uh, so let me also give credit to previous, uh, uh, previous, uh, previous administrations as well. I'm a great uh, fan of all the work that Jack McConnell did, but the whole administration that was behind him at that time in terms of re-establishing that relationship uh, with Malawi. And to his credit, uh, Lord McConnell is uh, happy to take phone calls whenever I need some advice on that uh, relationship. So well done for that. Uh, the relationship, uh, many people here have spoken about uh, the relationship needing to be more uh, than just aid uh, in that relationship that we've had with Malawi in terms of helping the poorest uh, in the world through NGO-funded projects. I want to touch upon some of those themes. Uh, Siobhan McMahon and also uh, Patricia Ferguson and their contributions as well as some others made reference to uh, uh, human rights and uh, the importance of equality in raising those. And I think that's absolutely correct. I think Patricia Ferguson used the phrase, phrase critical friend. I think that's exactly what we, we have to be. And uh, this government, uh, of course, condemns human rights abuses wherever they occur and exist. And in my meeting with the uh, Minister for Youth and Sport, uh, I, I mentioned uh, Malawi's uh, human rights. Uh, I mentioned uh, the fact that Scotland is a tolerant country, an open country, is one that believes in equality. I pointed to some of those steps that we've taken, be it in same-sex uh, marriage legislation and others, and said, look, we understand, of course, Malawi uh, is operating in a regional context. Scotland, Malawi is on a journey. Uh, make it, we want them to make progress. We're partners and willing to be partners in our human rights agencies uh, and civic society organisations. We'd work with their, theirs uh, to help them further make progress that is much needed uh, indeed. So she, she welcomed that message. So I can give you a, a reassurance uh, that that was done. Patricia Ferguson was also absolutely correct to make mention of that, uh, the numbers uh, that are involved in the relationship to it, not just one way. And the Scottish Malawi Partnership is an organisation I have a great amount of uh, time and uh, affection for. I think they do a, a fantastic amount of work. 400,000 people between Scotland and Malawi that are involved in that relationship. I mean, it is just incredible. Uh, the Scottish Malawi Partnership now have over 700 members uh, as part of their partnership. The Malawi-Scotland Partnership, I think, has broken the 100 uh, member uh, barrier as well. So that should be applauded. Uh, I was happy and, uh, to accept uh, both amendments, as I said, in that collaborative uh, spirit and um, very much uh, we work closely with uh, DFID uh, based in Malawi. I've met the head of DFID uh, in Malawi to discuss how we might work even uh, closer. I met with the former, uh, he was moved in the reshuffle, former Minister uh, of International Development, Alan Duncan, uh, on this matter uh, when he was in post uh, as well. And that will continue, regardless, frankly, of the constitutional setup uh, that we have uh, post-September the 18th. That will continue. And, uh, 
because we have those joint uh, goals of lifting the poorest out of poverty in Malawi. Uh, I've always been fair, uh, I would say, to giving credit to DFID as well, uh, having met their members of staff who work in Abercrombie House, uh, of the good work uh, that they do. I think uh, Patricia Ferguson was right to make mention that actually as much as we can uh, complement some of the work that DFID do, also we provide a complement uh, for, 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 for DFID and some of the work that they do. Uh, we have been uh, noted actually in the International Development uh, Select Committee in the House of Commons in their final report. Uh, of which I gave evidence in, in terms of Scottish independence that actually uh, we have a fantastic relationship with the Scottish Government in regards to, uh, maybe I added in the word fantastic, but uh, uh, paraphrasing, a uh, good relationship with our NGOs. And they said that actually DFID could, could, could learn and take a leaf out of the book in terms of the Scottish Government uh, and how we approach and how we work with civic society and uh, NGOs. So I also agree, of course, uh, wholeheartedly with Murdo Fraser and the Conservatives' uh, amendment. And uh, although uh, Full credit, although of course the UK government uh, has been working with the Malawian government in relation to civic governance, uh, the credit, of course, we would agree overwhelmingly for the peaceful uh, democratic uh, elections would have to go to the people of Malawi who have done well in their transition. Um, and you're right, also, Murdo Fraser was also correct that uh, Scots are, I would say, extra generous when it comes to international development. Not only do we contribute through our tax uh, money to the UK's uh, budget, which has met 0.7%, but also, of course, they contribute towards uh, our own efforts up here in Scotland. That gives me uh, fantastic pride. A number of members touched upon various facets of the relationship we have with Malawi, and I'll try to rattle through some of those as well. Sport was mentioned, uh, and, and in my discussions uh, with uh, Maureen watts pair the Minister for Youth and, and Sport, I said that we can do more to develop that relationship. The SFA are doing some projects in Malawi, but I think there's a lot more uh, we can do. I think Malawi became a lot of people's second, uh, second team during the Commonwealth Games because of that rapturous uh, uh, applause that they got and uh, welcome they got during the opening ceremony. It was a close-run affair for me. I, uh, Pakistan from my father and Kenya from my mother. Then the Tongalese athlete that came out with the Celtic top. You know, it was difficult. Uh, it was a difficult one for me to choose, but Malawi, uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely there. Uh, Myrtle Fraser touched on commerce, as did another of other members, Christina McKelvey and others, and I just wanted to say a little bit more on that. Uh, he mentioned the three C's of Dr. Ray Livingston, Christianity, Commerce and Civilization. Uh, Christiani Christianity, uh, uh, we can debate that one because uh, apparently he only converted one person and even that person became a lapsed Christian. <laughs> but his Christianity, I'm sure, was disposed in other, other ways and other methods. Commerce one is really important. Not only was Dr. David Livingston strong on this, but the first, uh, one of the first European companies to set up in Malawi that was the African Lakes Company, uh, John and Frederick Moyer in 1870s. And in fact, Mandala House, which is named where the headquarter was in Blantyre, and still is, uh, although the company's now dissolved, is still pictures of uh, Renfield Street, where the headquarters were in Glasgow. Uh, it was called Mandala and renamed Mandala, which uh, many, uh, even senior members of government and former President Joyce Bander, her mother worked at the Mandala Corporation, still uh, resonates with ethical and fair trade, because that company was uh, also set up. To, to, to defeat the, the, the slave trade. Sarah Boyack touched upon the energy relationship, and I think she made her points very well and very strongly. Um, myself and Paul Wheelhouse were delighted to, to host and take part in the European launch of the UN Decade of Sustainable Energy for All during the Commonwealth Games here in Glasgow, and uh, had a very passionate speech and uh, panel discussion with the UN Secretary General Special Representative, uh, Dr. Jim Keller, to deliver his keynote speech. Uh, trade, I've, I've somewhat mentioned, but uh, fair trade, Sarah Boyack also touched upon, and uh, you know, we've given our commitment to support that in any way that we can, of course, uh, becoming Scot helping to, uh, for Scotland to become the second uh, fair trade nation uh, in the world. Mizuzu Coffee, I know, is already being traded here. Uh, and in the business conference that was jointly hosted for the Commonwealth Games by the Prime Minister and the First Minister, uh, I hosted a panel session on trade and investment with the Commonwealth and how we can lift. Uh, those countries out of poverty by closer trade links, so I'm happy to commit to do that. Richard Simpson touched upon the health uh, side of things, spoke with great authority uh, in that regard and in great depth, and uh, I agree with much of uh, what he was saying. Uh, the temptation, though, I think, for a Scottish government, be we as part of the UK, or frankly, even if we were independent, the temptation might be to try to do too much, be everything to everybody. I think he was right to say that there's a couple of narrow fields of health that you can concentrate on and actually make a big impact. And you touched upon infectious diseases. Uh, I mentioned this in, uh, in, in the International Development uh, Committee when I was giving evidence. And uh, Jeremy Lefroy, MP, wrote me a nice card because he's very, uh, he's very uh, involved in the Global Fund in terms of tackling infectious 
uh, diseases to say that uh, he thought our approach on this uh, was, was, was to, be, to be welcomed. Uh, yeah, sorry, the Minister uh, is winding up. No, I'm sorry. I can't take an intervention. And the winding up, uh, in conclusion, uh, I would just like to reiterate what everybody has said about the depth and strength of the relationship up and down the country, across uh, all uh, education sectors, across the health sector, across faith groups, and so on and so forth. And Malawi as, is known as the warm heart of Africa. It gave me great pride when the Malawian High Commissioner said that Scotland uh, was the warm heart of Europe through their humanitarianism and through our compassion. Long may it continue and thank all the members across the, party, across the chamber for their continued support. Thank you. We move now to the next item of business, which is a statement by Kenny McCaskill on policing. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should be therefore no interventions or interruptions. Um, I recognise that we have moved early to this statement, um, but members are well aware now that we follow on um, from debates to statements. I take note that there are some members, particularly front benchers, who are not present from uh, for the statement itself. Um, I will take that into account when I decide who is going to be called to speak. I now call on Kenny McCaskill. Mr McCaskill, you've got ten minutes. Presiding officer, I welcome this opportunity to make a statement to Parliament on the use of armed officers within the routinely unarmed police service of Scotland, of which we are so rightly proud. Let me take this opportunity to thank the police service for their contribution uh, for what has been the best ever Commonwealth Games. They did so in a manner that was friendly and welcoming, in the manner displayed by the city of Glasgow. And indeed, two officers even played a starring cameo role in the opening ceremony. Scotland is rightly proud that its police officers conduct their daily business unarmed. That has always been the case and let me make it clear to Parliament that is how we intend it will remain. However, armed officers have, for a very considerable period of time, provided support for police colleagues and security for citizens. However, the public should be assured that the number of officers authorised to carry weapons are low and limited. Only 275 officers out of the 17,318 officers employed by Police Scotland are currently deployed on firearms duties. This is less than 1.6% of our police force. It should also be made clear that these officers operate in a shift system, are subject to extraction and indeed holiday entitlement. There will therefore only be a fraction of that already low number who are on duty at any one time. Presiding officer, gun crime in Scotland is rare but in the first year of Police Scotland, specialist firearms units attended 1,300 incidents across the whole of the country, including more than 100 in the Highlands. And it's not just gun crime and firearms incidents that they deal with. They're called out to deal with incidents where there's a significant threat. These incidents can involve knives, samurai swords, machetes, or even broken bottles. The presence of these officers in such situations is necessary for the safety of colleagues and public alike. Therefore, it's essential that the Chief Constable had the operational flexibility he needs to properly protect the public and the safety of his officers. The decision for the deployment of armed officers and the granting of standing firearms authority within a police force that is recognised as being one that goes about its day-to-day -day business unarmed is therefore an operational matter for the Chief Constable. This has always been the case. That is how it was before the inception of Police Scotland, and that is how it remains. The current Standing Firearms Authority was given by the Chief Constable after an assessment of a range of factors, including evidence and intelligence. This authority is not new. Three of the former constabularies, Strathclyde, Tayside and indeed Northern, had endorsed this position prior to the inception of the service. This is also the approach taken by 42 out of 43 of the services in England and Wales. Presiding officer, it was clear when we debated the legislation in this parliament a couple of years ago that operational independence was paramount. From all sides of the chambers, it was made clear that our democratic structures required the chief constable had operational independence and was free from political interference. However, 
Given the powers of police officers and the need to ensure the protection of the rights of citizens, safeguards were built in. Firstly, to ensure the separation of powers between government and police, the Scottish Police Authority was established by this Parliament. It is for the authority to appoint the Chief Constable and to hold him or her to account. The Scottish Police Authority has a broad membership with a wide range of experience. Secondly, Parliament decided that as we were moving to a single service for Scotland, it was appropriate that the Parliament of Scotland had oversight. And it's for that reason that the subcommittee of the Justice Committee was established. The policing subcommittee is able to scrutinise all aspects of policing. However, it's not just those safeguards, but additional checks and balances that have been built in. Firstly, there's the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner. This has been established under the Act to deal not simply with any complaints against the police, but to deal with actions of the police. Any use of a firearm will automatically be remitted to him. Secondly, we have Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary for Scotland. They are long established and have a great experience not just of advising the service, but the government on the quality of policing and indeed the nature of police activities. HMICS is independent from the Chief Constable and from government and is able to advise without fear or favour. He provides a further level of scrutiny of police officers irrespective of rank and the decisions they take. This includes all aspects of operational decisions, including Standing Firearms Authority. Thirdly, a Standing Firearms Authority is reviewed quarterly this ensures that a regular and indeed contemporary basis for the granting is there of what is exceptional authority for a police officer in a routinely unarmed constabulary. The next review is due next month. The Chief Constable has already confirmed publicly that in addition to considering available information and intelligence, he will take on board views and representations that have been made and I welcome that commitment by the Chief. And I welcome that further assurance will be provided by HMICS on this occasion. And as normal, the report of HMICS will be published and available to this Parliament. Presiding Officer, I believe that the public understands and accepts the need for a small number, and I stress a small number, of police officers to be authorised to carry firearms and for the Chief Constable to have operational independence over their deployment and use. However, I also understand the concern of the public that we do not slip into a situation where officers become armed as a matter of routine practice, which would clearly go beyond the operational matters into matters of policy. And I want to give the Parliament and the public my assurance this will not happen. Following discussion with the Chief Constable, I can confirm that he's agreed to provide quarterly reports to the SPA and the Parliamentary Subcommittee on the number of officers currently deployed on firearms duties. As an additional measure and reassurance to Parliament, I can announce that should the number of officers deployed on firearms duties routinely exceed 2% of the total numbers of the officers in Scotland, then the Chief Constable will notify the SPA and the Justice Secretary of this fact. There may, of course, be specific occasions when there is a need to increase numbers on a short-term basis in order to respond to specific risks and threats. And we fully support the Chief Constable's operational duty to take immediate decisions that reflect any such threats. Presiding officer, in conclusion, can I once again state that we should be proud of the fact that our police officers are routinely unarmed, despite the challenges and dangers they face on a daily basis. However, I believe it's necessary in the world in which we live for the safety of officers and indeed members of the public, that a very limited number are there capable of providing both firearms and taser support. Armed officers do a difficult job and one of which we should be proud. In a democracy, it is right that it should be the decision of the Chief Constable and not a political minister or party. 
However, it is also important that there should be sufficient safeguards and checks and balances. It is for that reason that we have the Scottish Police Authority and the Subcommittee on Policing. It's for that reason that we have the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary for Scotland, and a Standing Firearms Authority that is reviewed on a quarterly basis. I hope, Presiding Officer, that Parliament will join me in thanking not just the officers for their service during the Commonwealth Games, but for the job they do on a daily basis in their communities, the length and breadth of Scotland. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow around about 20 minutes for questions, after which we will go on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary were to press the request to speak button now. And I call on Graham Pearson. Uh, I'm obliged to present officer. Uh, by explanation for some who may have been slightly late in entering the chamber, they would have been waiting for the belated arrival of the Cabinet Secretary's statement, which was very late in, in delivery. Secondly, this Excuse is... Excuse me, Mr Pearson. Can I, sit down? Can I say that two wrongs do not make a right? When we move on to the statement in the chamber, I expect members to be here on the issue of um, the statement not coming. The member will be aware... Um, the opposition spokespersons receive a ministerial statement no less than one hour in advance of the statement we made. That is the Convention. I am concerned to hear that this was not observed in relation to today's statement on policing. It was also not the case in relation to the statement on data retention. This may be something the opposition business managers wish to discuss with the Minister for Parliamentary Business. If you can continue your question. Um, given the substantial public disquiet uh, and his evidence reluctance to share with Parliament, what legislation demands that he regards such non-urgent policy shifts to be maintained as solely the remit of the Chief Constable in terms of an assertion of operational independence and what boundaries apply in the application of operational dependence? Only on the 23rd of March this year, an officer unintentionally fired a, a gun in a police station and was deemed to be negligent in an accident which was preventable. Will he initiate a review of the policy by ensuring that the SPA plays an effective role in terms of governance, oversight, transparency, given the de declared discomfort of some board members? And if not, what is the point of a police authority? And what happened to the much acclaimed consultation process at local level before such changes? Thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I very much regret the uh, inability to have the uh, statement sent earlier. I apologise for that discourtesy. I don't know the reasons uh, for it. Uh, with regard to the particular instance of the discharge of the firearm in a police station, Mr Pearson will know that that was in fact obviously remitted to the PERC. It was reviewed by the PERC and indeed the PERC statement has indeed been published and Police Scotland will of course take on board the recommendations and advice that has been made. What I can say is that we have built in as a result of the debate that went on both in the country and through this parliament when we were setting up the single national service. That's why we have the SPA and the policing subcommittee, a matter that Mr Pearson championed, why we have additional section balances in terms of the PERC, HMICS and a quarterly review. I have spoken today to the uh, chair of the SPA and he is happy with the uh, statement that has been given and the action that has been taken. And I would hope that Mr Pearson would continue to contribute, as he does as a member of that policing committee, to the scrutiny of the police. And if he has comments to make about the SPA, that he should do so to the chair, to my other members. They do meet in public on a monthly basis, and I'm sure Vic Emery and his colleagues would be happy to meet and discuss their work with him. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for at least some advance notice of this statement. The fact that throughout Scotland there are police officers carrying firearms while responding to every day's duties is deeply disturbing for the public at large, and this does represent a change in policy. And the fears that have been heightened by these fears have been heightened in the public by the unacceptable lack of transparency and accountability in uh, particular on this issue. Cabinet Secretary, it's been consistently acknowledged in this chamber that someone who carries a knife 
uh, for whatever reason, is in danger of using that weapon or becoming a victim of knife crime. And it's an interesting analogy with the arming of police because there's a real apprehension that if police officers routinely carry a weapon, that weapon will be used in a manner other than that intended. So can the Cabinet Secretary answer the following? How are these officers who carry firearms selected? How many police in Scotland have been trained in the carrying and use of firearms? And finally, what form has this training taken and how frequently has it taken place and is it due to take place in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I first of all put on record the fact that I do take pride, as I think everybody in the Chamber does, that police officers in Scotland, in the main, routinely go around unarmed. That is the norm. It is a very limited number in response to Margaret Mitchell's questions. But these officers, the overwhelming majority, 98% of police officers in Scotland, do so and sometimes face very difficult and dangerous positions. And we should pay tribute to that and take great pride in that they do so without routine ability uh, to access firearms. There are, though, and have always been, officers who have been routinely armed. This is not a new policy, as I indicated in the initial opening statement, Ms Mitchell. Uh, this is the policy that was operated by three out of the eight former legacy forces, Strathclyde, Tayside and, indeed, Northern. What the Chief Constable has done is ensure that this goes across the country. In terms of how these officers are selected, I have to say that is an operational matter I do not know. I have no doubt that there are significant checks carried out, uh, that they are ongoing on a regular basis, but recruitment both into the police and, indeed, into specialist areas within the police service, I think, is correctly a matter for the Chief Constable. Uh, there are over 500 officers who are authorised firearms officers, but only 275 officers have standing firearms authority, who are those officers who have been seen by members of the public, who are a small fraction of that 275. But as an administration, we appreciate the concerns, which is why not only do we reiterate the che checks and balances that we have, but we are ensuring further safeguards so that the public can be reassured. There is not a routinely armed police and there will never be under this administration. Christine Graham, followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As the Chamber knows, I chair both the Subcommittee on Policing and the Justice Committee, and I note the references in the statement to that subcommittee and indeed the Chief Inspector of Constabulary. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the subcommittee correspondence to the SP on the issue of armed police and the responses thereto, and the issue therefore remains live before that subcommittee. But is he also aware that in two weeks' time the Chief Inspector of Constabulary will be giving evidence to the Justice Committee, so no doubt army of police will arise in? Does he therefore agree that there is is parliamentary scrutiny, but will he also respond to any relevant issues arising from that scrutiny by both the subcommittee and the justice committee? Cabinet uh, well, I can give the member that assurance and, and rules convener, and indeed is the member asking. Uh, we will obviously respond as administration to that. Uh, I'm glad HMICS is uh, going uh, to her committee. I'll be meeting with them myself uh, shortly. Uh, we welcome the fact that Parliament established not just the Scottish Police Authority, but as we now have a national service serving all of Scotland, that there should be a role for the National Parliament. That was a matter quite correctly championed by Graham Pearson, and I give due credit to him. I am grateful for all those members who served on the committee chaired by Christine Graham. I know that it has met on 21 occasions. I am aware that the Chief Constable has appeared before it on three times, and on six occasions his deputies or assistants have attended on his behalf. I have no doubt they will receive the same uh, welcome and, indeed, uh, challenge uh, indeed for as HMICS will, will uh, face in due course. But I am grateful for that role. It is an important role to ensure that we have oversight and scrutiny as well as avoiding political interference by a Cabinet Secretary who represents a political party. Elaine Murray, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Armed police were never used on routine operations in Dumfries and Galloway prior to the advent of Police Scotland. And once again, there has been no consultation or even communication with the local community about this major change in practice. So what information will be made available to elected representatives about the deployment of armed police in their wards or constituencies? Will we, not with a desire to interfere politically, as I was accused of doing by the Chief Constable a couple of weeks ago, but on behalf of our constituents and their concerns, be kept informed about when and how armed police officers have been involved locally in patrols and routine incidents? 
Well, I have met the uh, armed response officers in Dumfries and Galloway and those who now serve within the police service of Scotland. I am grateful for the service that they do. On past occasions, I pay tribute to them when they also went to lend support uh, to officers south of the border when there was a tragedy and a significant firearms incident. I have also paid tribute to them more recently when they have had to address firearms incidents and armed robberies, for example, in uh, the members' constituency in Dumfries. It is important that there is oversight and scrutiny. Uh, the police service has particular powers that are not available to the ordinary citizen. That is why, when the legislation was passed, we ensured that those safeguards and those checks and balances were there. I do not think that I need to reiterate it. Equally, we are also ensured that there is engagement at local level uh, between the police uh, and the local commander and, indeed, other ranks there uh, with those who serve in the local policing committee in whatever manner the local authority has set it up. But in addition to that local engagement, I am aware, and I think it is a matter of public knowledge, that the Chief has gone out of his way to engage with councillors, for example, in the north of Scotland, where they have expressed concerns. I am grateful to him for that, so I think we have that appropriate balance and we have also preserved the police from political partiality. Alison McInnes, followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you very much. When I queried why um, up to 20 minutes ago we had not received this statement, um, I was advised that it was still being worked on. That does not demonstrate to me a confident government. It suggests that there is some turmoil behind the scenes on this. Um, the Minister um, reference the authority for armed officers will be reviewed. Um, any decent and sensible way forward would follow a strategic firearms and risk assessment, and that in turn should be determined by future demands and threats. It stretches credibility to ask us to believe that the threats and risks across Scotland are all the same. And in the absence of any evidence this afternoon from the Minister, uh, this is surely disproportionate to the risk. His statement has not gone far enough, and we must have a full review of the decision to move to overtly armed officers deployed on routine duties across our towns and villages. This is not about how many, it is about that change in deployment. And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to make this the last time he is dragged to the Chamber to belatedly react to the citizens' concerns. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, I again uh, express my regret to uh, Alison uh, McInnes that the uh, statement was not available. I do not know the reason for that. I can assure that I have uh, uh, had it before me for some time, but I do not know what uh, was ongoing. What I can say is, first of all, the Chief Constable correctly carries out the assessment. It is reviewed on a three-monthly basis. That is guidance and guidelines that go across the border. Uh, given the significance of firearms, given that we take pride, as I have said earlier, on a routinely unarmed police force, these things should only be done on the basis of intelligence, proper analysis, uh, and that has to be dealt with by the Chief Constable. Uh, so, firstly, we have a three-monthly review, and as I have said, that review will take place next month, uh, coincidentally. Equally, as I said, the Chief Constable has taken and said publicly that he will take on board the views, now, doubtless not just of councillors sharing Ms McInnes's political affiliation north of the border, but also comments that will be made in the Chamber today. Equally, the decision on this, I think, is correctly made by the Chief Constable. He is the person who has the information, the intelligence, the analysis. I do not have it. In many instances, it would be quite wrong for it to be given to me. But he has the experience and that information before him. But because of the significance and the infringement sometimes perhaps to civil liberties and certainly the alarm it can cause. We ensure that those numbers are limited and we ensure that we have the safeguards and the checks and balances. But this is a matter for the Chief Constable held to account by the appropriate authorities that we have enshrined. Kevin Stewart, followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Having served on a police board for some 13 years, I can say uh, wholeheartedly that uh, with the local policing committees, the Scottish Police Authority and the subcommittee, uh, we now have greater scrutiny than I think we have ever had before. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, to provide the detail of the training that is provided to specialist officers and what independent oversight is in place in relation to this training? Cabinet Secretary. Some of these aspects are obviously operational, but what I can say to the member is all authorised firearms officers are trained rigorously to the standards defined in the UK National Police Firearms Training Curriculum. And this involves initial training and frequently refresher training, and it is a significant investment by Police Scotland. 
The oversight that the member asked upon is exercised through the College of Policing, who ensure that the training delivered is consistent throughout the UK and meets the standards of authorised professional practice for armed policing. And I would thank and indeed concur with the member that in fact we now have, as I say, a greater scrutiny. And in practice, I can say UK services, including Police Scotland, deliver training locally, but they are independently assessed by the College of Policing to ensure that their training delivery meets that national standard. Senator White, followed by Patricia Fergus. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has said in a statement that the Standing Firearms Authority reviewed quarterly. Indeed, it is due to meet next month. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Chief Constable will take public concerns into account on an ongoing basis? Cabinet Secretary. And I can reaffirm to the Chamber, as I said in the initial statement, that the Chief Constable has made it clear that not only is the Standing Firearms Authority to be reviewed anyway in September, but he's made it clear he will take on board not just the review, but those comments that have been made and may continue to be made to him up to and until when he makes his uh, uh, report to review. And as I said in my statement, as an additional safeguard, should the number of officers with Standing Firearms Authority at any one time exceed 2 per cent of the total number of officers, uh, other than uh, some instance that has arised, if it's to be routine, then the Chief Constable will inform the SPA, the Committee and me. Patricia Fergus, from followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has been at great pains to say that three of the former constabularies, Strathclyde, Tayside and Northern, had endorsed the position of there being a standing firearms authority prior to the inception of the new service. I wonder if he can confirm that the police boards in those three areas were of that view and gave that authorisation to the Chief Constable to bring about that change in policy. Well, I don't think I can be asked to answer for something that's not you know, my responsibility. These were the procedures carried out by those three authorities. They signed them off. I think if Ms Ferguson has cause for concern, she should raise it with those members who served upon that. All I can reiterate is that the arming of police officers is not new, it, it is not routine, and it is certainly the intention of this administration to ensure that we never have a routine armed police presence on every street or in every community. We take pride in our police officers, sometimes with great bravery, going out at their own risk equally to ensure their safety and indeed general public safety. We have to have access to a very limited number and thankfully a very low number of specialist officers. Roderick Campbell, followed by John. F uh, sit down, please. Uh, unless it's a point of order. Of order, presiding officer. And I'm sorry that the. Uh, Cabinet Secretary seems to be suggesting that there may be criticism of the bravery of individual officers. That is not the case. However, what I was querying was what I was querying from his statement was the fact that he prayed in aid the fact that three of these authorities had endorsed this position prior to the inception of the new force and now tells us that is not a matter for him and that I should take it up with those authorities. It is part of the Cabinet Secretary's statement, Presiding Officer, and therefore he should be able to stand that information up or withdraw it. That is not a point of order. Rod Campbell, followed by John Fitt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, legislation rightly ensures that the Chief Constable is operationally independent so that decisions on policing are made free of political interference. However, could the Cabinet Secretary provide further detail on the role of the Scottish Police Authority that has in holding the Chief Constable to account in relation to the deployment of armed officers? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, well, I would agree with the member that decisions in policing should be free from political interference. I think that would be a sad day for democracy. And it was one of the main issues that we debated and discussed when Parliament passed the bill. The Chief Constable is, as I stated, accountable to the SPA and not to ministers. That's entirely appropriate. The SPA challenges and supports the Chief Constable to ensure the delivery of the best possible policing. I've outlined the role the SPA will play in ensuring the appropriate use of armed officers. I've spoken to the uh, chair of the authority earlier today and he is uh, happy and supportive of the uh, proposals. He welcomes the uh, contribution that will be made in terms of the information provided to him and indeed I think if the member or any other member in the chamber wishes to make suggestions the SPA will be happy to engage with them and to take on board any thoughts or views that they may have. John Finney followed by Christian Allard. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. I apologise to you and the Cabinet Secretary for missing his, his opening few words and to thank him for that statement. Cabinet Secretary, you made reference to the Highlands and Islands in Northern in more than one occasion, and there have been various versions of who indeed when was responsible the, for the fundamental change to the very successful policing style. This is not about skills, it is not about numbers. Three armed officers attending a minor incident in Inverness High Street is not what the public want to see. It is also inconceivable that a risk assessment would change at midnight for five of the constituent forces. Indeed, that is lazy management. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary will agree to publish the decision-making process behind that change policy for each of the constituent forces and indeed place that in spice. That would be one way of uh, advancing your, your view that local policing was considered there. It's certainly not my view, and it's certainly not the public's view. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I don't have that information. The information that would apply to previous police boards belongs to police boards, or indeed to their constituent members. It's not something that the government would routinely have access to. That is an, uh, an issue that perhaps the member would be better raising uh, with council uh, colleagues. Uh, I do understand, and we do take on board the concerns that people have seeing armed officers attending at various incidents. But can I perhaps just say to the member and to the chamber, there was a reference made to an incident in Glasgow last uh, week or a fortnight ago uh, where armed police attended a road traffic incident. Can I say that I saw the information made available by Police Scotland on that? They did that because the armed vehicle was the closest to the incident. When they arrived there, they sought to have others come to relieve them, but because of other pressure and business, no other colleagues were there to get there. One of the three ladies injured had, I think, a broken or dislocated hip. She was in significant pain. And the members should perhaps listen to this. The police officer, in my understanding from the report, cradled the lady as she was dealt with by medical staff. They didn't wish to be there. They would rather have departed and allowed officers and they could have got back on to other patrolling. But I think they did the right thing. I think those officers should be commended, not condemned. Had other officers been available, they would have departed. But I think it was much better that they took part in assisting the welfare and care of that lady at a road traffic incident than they waved goodbye, said it's nothing to do with us, and left her in pain and suffering. Christian Allard, followed by John Pentland. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I would like to say that I checked my mail, email box this morning and I didn't receive any uh, emails from the public regarding that subject. But may I ask the Cabinet Secretary what criteria is applied by Police Scotland deciding to deploy armed officers and what assurances can he give that deployment would remain proportionate? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think I can be quite clear that the Chief Constable has made it quite clear that he does not wish to see any increase, that uh, uh, there may be instances that may arise subject to intelligent and analysis, uh, but to ensure that, having discussed matters with them, we've made it quite clear that any increase above 2 per cent would have to be, uh, on a less routine basis, would have to be reported to us and indeed to the SPA and the Committee. I think what we are ensuring, though, is that please, the Chief Constable's taking on board the evidence and intelligence that he has. He is keeping numbers low and proportionate. He is ensuring that all areas in Scotland are able to be protected, and that is our comments that he has made. And as I say, I think that the changes that the Police Service of Scotland now offers in providing all areas of Scotland, whether with trunk road policing, whether with dogs, horses or other aspects, is something that we should welcome and support. And armed policing is something that has always been there. What we have to ensure is that the routine bobby on our beat remains unarmed. That is how it will be equally, when there may be times that challenge that officer or challenge our communities. Resource and backup, whether for firearms or tasers, must always be available. John Pentland, followed by Ken President, officer, please accept my apologies for being late and missing the Cabinet Secretary's uh, open uh, remarks. But, President Officer, nobody is arguing against firearms. You know, what is mostly irrelevant in this statement has failed to address why, instead of being available in vehicles, they are now being routinely carried without good cause. Why is this fundamental change in policing being hidden behind an arbitrary 2 per cent figure when the best safeguard is to revert to the previous policy? Well, I go back to 
the two particular points I'll be making. First of all, Parliament decided quite correctly that decisions on operational matters would be for the Chief Constable. Uh, I think there was great concern, understandable concern, that a Cabinet Secretary of whatever political hue may seek to interfere. And on that basis, we've made it quite clear that the lines of authority are to the Scottish Police uh, Authority and indeed to the Parliamentary Subcommittee. Equally, we recognise that operational matters are best made by the Chief Constable, whoever he or she may be, because they are the individual with the information, with the intelligence, we're able to make that risk assessment. So it's for that Chief Constable at that time to make that decision held to account here in Parliament by the Policing Committee, held to account by the Scottish Police Authority who appoint him, and indeed, as I say, I also welcome the additional checks and balances and the commitment that we have made about keeping numbers low to ensure that the people of Scotland can always be reassured our police in the main are routinely unarmed. Okay, McIntosh. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I also apologise uh, for my late arrival and not anticipating the Closure, early closure of the last debate. The Cabinet Secretary makes great play of the fact that this radical change in policy predates the establishment of the new police service. Can I ask him to clarify whether it predates his time in the, as the appointment does as Justice Secretary for Scotland? And given his inability to point to any public discussion by any police board of this radical change in policy, can I ask him simply to clarify whether he believes there should have been a public discussion of this change in policy before it was implemented? Well, as for the precise timing, Mr McIntosh is not only a member but resides in Strathclyde. The responsibility, the decision was taken by the Chief Constable of Strathclyde, who was held to account at that stage uh, by the Police Authority and Police Board for Strathclyde. It was their decision uh, and it was them who were holding the Chief Constable to account. My responsibility with regard to the National Service uh, came in only subject to the passing of the Act, but again subject to the clear guidance of Parliament, quite correctly to ensure that there is no political interference. It is a decision not for Strathclyde Board or the Legacy Forces, it is a decision for the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, if Mr McIntosh was not aware when Strathclyde took that, it may be matters he would wish to raise with political colleagues in his own area. Thank you. That ends that particular statement. The next item of business is a statement by Ken McCaskill on the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act UK legislation. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement. There should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Ken McCaskill, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Uh, Presiding Officer, I would like to make a statement about the UK Government's Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act, which received royal assent on 17 July 2014. And I begin by acknowledging the huge level of public interest generated by this piece of Westminster legislation, raising, as it did, fundamental issues about civil liberties, privacy, security and the role of government. It is in every government's interest that we combat crime and address security risks. And I'm sure that everyone in this chamber will agree with that. As sophisticated criminals and terrorists seek to exploit an ever-changing and rapidly developing telecommunications market, so too must our law enforcement and security and intelligence agencies have the tools they require to keep pace if they are to keep us safe. They need to be able to track down the drug dealers, head off would-be terrorists, pursue human traffickers, deal with child exploitation, and find missing persons. Serious organised criminals and terrorists have no respect for borders. The response from law enforcement, security and intelligence agencies and other partners requires a joined-up approach to those threats. Such an approach was demonstrated in response to the events of 30 June 2007, when two terrorists attempted to drive a jeep through the entrance doors of the terminal at Glasgow Airport. Another example is demonstrated in the case of Ezzedin Khaled Ahmed al Khaledi, who was found to have links to the Stockholm bombing, which took place in December 2010. And again, joint working proved essential in bringing this individual to justice. What is clear here is that when it comes to tackling these issues, we are all on the same side. But this situation cannot be used to explain away a need for proper scrutiny of powerful legislative changes and the tools that are needed to protect us must not be left unguarded by parliaments or used in an unfettered way. The provisions in the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act passed on July 17th are reserved, but they extend to Scotland 
and have implications for justice in Scotland. The subject matter relates to powers that enable law enforcement agencies in Scotland to prevent and detect crime and prevent acts of terrorism. Communications data, the who, the when, the where and the how of communication, not its content, is an essential element of Police Scotland's capability to respond to a wide range of operational issues and can be used evidentially by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and can provide evidence that can be considered by the courts. It is clear to me that there was always going to be a significant level of interest in Scotland in these matters, and that is why we are discussing it today. And it is regrettable, to say the least, that the Scottish Government was not given the opportunity that it should have been afforded to properly consider and express views on this very significant piece of legislation. In May 2010, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, announced that he wanted an agenda of respect. And I quote, This agenda is about Parliament's working together of governing with respect, both because I want to try and win Scotland's respect as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Close quotes. Uh, the level of respect appears not to have been afforded to the Scottish Government on this occasion. A joint announcement on the intention to legislate was made by the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister on the morning of Thursday, 10 July. This was followed by a ministerial statement from the Home Secretary, Theresa May, later that same morning. I received a copy of the draft bill by email that day, provided in advance of a hastily arranged telephone conversation I was to have with James Brokenshire, the Minister for Security and Immigration. This ignores the proper processes expected from a Westminster Government when passing legislation which extends to Scotland. <coughs> However, it was not only the Scottish Government who were denied the opportunity to have their say. Elected representatives in the UK Parliament were denied the time and opportunities the Bill merited to consider and scrutinise its provisions. As members in this chamber will no doubt be aware, the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Bill was subject to Westminster's emergency procedures. The Bill had its first reading in the Commons uh, on Monday, 14 July, and achieved royal assent on Thursday, 17 July. The reasons for this fast-track approach were provided in the Home Secretary's parliamentary statement on 10 July. A judgment by the European Court of Justice called into question the legal basis upon which the UK Government required communications service providers in the UK to retain communications data. The second reason was an increasingly pressing need, and I quote, to put beyond doubt the application of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act regarding the obligation on communications service providers to comply with legal obligations irrespective of where those businesses are based. There was a period of some three months between the European Court's judgment and the announcement of measures to address them. During the subsequent questions on the Home Secretary's statement on 10 July, the Conservative Member of Parliament, Davis Davis, said, and I quote, the Home Secretary has justified rushing this bill through the House on the basis of an emergency. However, the case was put to the ECJ some time ago, and it took some time to reach its conclusion on 8 April. So if there is an emergency, it was a predictable one on 8 April. And I end quote. In the three months between 8 April and 10 July, I would suggest there was ample opportunity for the respect that David Cameron described so fulsomely in 2010 to have been paid to this government and parliament. Labour, Watson, Labour MP Tom Watson also criticised the process, and he said, and I quote, I have no doubt that the Home Secretary will get her bill through next week, but the price will be a perception that it is a result of a last-minute deal between elites with little scrutiny by Parliament or civic society, end quote. The Scottish Government is supportive of Police Scotland having access to the information it requires in order to keep communities safe. But I believe that 
where the power of the state impinges on the liberty of its citizens, then it is imperative that elected representatives must always have an opportunity to debate the issues. We have said in Scotland's future that in an independent Scotland, legislation will set out clear arrangements for investigatory powers, building on and updating where necessary the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act and the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Scotland Act. Planned legislation will ensure that law enforcement agencies have the powers that they need to do their job and keep Scotland safe, while also clarifying the limit of those powers and the extent of the controls over them. Any new powers will, of course, be fully considered and debated in this chamber. Presiding officer, when it comes to combating international problems such as organised crime and terrorism, we must all pull together. The ability of our law enforcement partners to be able to access and use the full range of investigatory powers is a critical part of our approach to tackling these problems and issues. And I find the lack of engagement from the UK Government in this instance regrettable. There was ample time for views to have been exchanged and sufficient opportunity for the respect that David Cameron spoke about in 2010 to have been paid to each of us sitting here today and to the people of Scotland who elected us to represent them. Thank you. Can I just say to members, I need to finish at five o'clock. Uh, Elaine Murray, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And obviously, Presiding Officer, I would like, have liked to have to, uh, thanked the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement, uh, but I received it only ten minutes before I had to sprint to the chambers. So I am unable to do so. The justice system is a balance between individual freedoms and restrictions on those freedoms to ensure the public safety and to preserve the human rights of other individuals. Now, undoubtedly, the UK Government did not handle the consequences of the ruling by the European Court of Justice last April as well as it ought to have done. However, it is not the only Government to have encountered issues when to trying to rush through emergency legislation, as I am sure the Cabinet Secretary will recall. However, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the legislation passed by the UK Parliament in July contains greater safeguards and controls than the original Act, including cutting the number of agencies which can access retained data and enabling the Information Commissioner to audit the integrity and the deletion of retained data. Does he accept that, in this age of social media and electronic communication, information held by internet companies and phone providers can be vital to the investigation and detection, not only of terrorist activities, but of atrocities such as child sexual abuse and paedophile rings, as evidenced only yesterday by the arrest of a convicted paedophile in Texas on the basis of material supplied by Google. The Cabinet Secretary's Westminster colleagues voted against the legislation. Is it therefore the case that the SNP Government in an independent Scotland would not permit the tool of, of data retention to be used? And if so, what would it do to protect public safety in this age of electronic communication and to support the human rights of the victims of online abuse. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I first of all say that no, the Scottish Government accepts that uh, covert uh, work is required north, south of the border, in every jurisdiction to keep us safe and secure. And I mentioned that in the statement, and the same points that I made were replicated and echoed by uh, Elaine Murray. Of course, we require to address those who would bring and flood drugs into our community, who would traffic people, who would perpetrate atrocities that we have indeed uh, seen carried out elsewhere and were sought to be carried out here. So we fully accept that there is a basis and justification for this work being carried out. But there are two points that we have to make. First of all, the process here was not followed. There is a respect agenda that required to be made to this government, to this parliament, to also include the other agencies in Scotland who were, albeit cited in some ways, were not given the opportunity to participate, contribute to the proper scrutiny of parliamentary debate. There is the principle, and as I say, I have accepted that there is a requirement for this, Equally, I accept that this matter is currently reserved. I think we have to ensure that we get the balance right. Uh, I recognise that and I mate with the Information Commission, and I pay tribute to him and his predecessor, and I welcome the work that they do. But in some extent, some of the principle of the bill, I can criticise the process. In terms of some of the principle, I have to say I side with my Westminster colleagues. I also side both with David Davis and with Tom Watson. Some of this we just don't know. It's been rushed through. Some of that information we must never know because it would compromise the security and safety of investigation and perhaps officers or individuals in the field. 
but we do not and did not have an opportunity for the proper scrutiny that was required. And I have to say, I contrast some of the information being sought by the members in this statement with regard to some of the points they made in the latter. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Marco Biaggi. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Again, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the albeit very limited advance sight of this statement. And today of all days, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will appreciate and agree that in an ideal world, all legislation and indeed ministerial statements would be introduced at the appropriate time and as soon as possible. But as governments of all political persuasions know, this isn't always possible, the CADR emergency legislation and Scottish Parliament being a case in point. So the issue before us today is not necessarily the time frame in which the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act was introduced, but rather its content. This was emergency legislation brought forward to clarify the legislative framework for certain important investigatory powers to ensure that the UK law enforcement and intelligence agencies can maintain their ability to access telecommunications data. And let's be quite clear, this is data that the police need to investigate criminal activity and to protect the public. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that it was necessary and he's in supportive in principle of passing this act to ensure that this crucial data, which is a powerful tool to those investigating horrific crimes such as child exploitation and terrorism, can be accessed and isn't lost, which might have been the case had the legislation not been passed? And does he also agree the Act should cover anyone providing a communication service to customers in the UK, regardless of where that service is based? Cabinet well, I think we're all agreed to crown the same, but some of this data has to be accessed. It's a question of proportionality and the question of ensuring that we have sufficient checks and balances and indeed safeguards. In terms of the time, uh, the timing issue was not raised by me. I would refer to the quote that I gave to the member in the opening statement. The timing issue was raised by David Davis. He's not a member of the Scottish National Party group in Westminster. He was a former challenger for the leadership of the Conservative Party. It was David Davis, and I think, to be fair to Mr Davis, he accepts that some of this is clearly necessary. His point, though, was this case was put to the ECJ some time ago. It reached its conclusion on 8 April. He made it quite clear that if it was an emergency, it was an emergency that was predictable on the 8th of April, and it was only on the 10th of July that this was being rushed through Parliament. So that goes back, I think, to process. Everybody accepts the principle. It's where you draw the line in terms of the principle. But the process here would seem to me to be certainly uh, have failed, certainly in respect of the respect agenda, and indeed, arguably, the points being made not simply by my parliamentary colleagues, but indeed by David Davis, Tom Watson, and many others, was that there was insufficient opportunity for proper scrutiny in Westminster, and that's where the failure was. Marco Biaggi, followed by Willie Rennie. The Cabinet Secretary has repeatedly re referred to the gap between the judgment on the 8th of April and the bill being uh, announced on the 10th of July. Uh, presumably, since civil servants wouldn't have just put pen to paper on 10th of July, there would have been a process involved in the run-up to that. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm when he was first notified, if it was indeed on the, the 10th of July, when the bill was already in draft form, and what he would have expected to have had as input to that kind of drafting uh, process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a draft copy of the bill was emailed to me at 10.20 a.m. on Thursday, 10th July, which was the day that the UK government announced its plans at Westminster. Uh, to be fair to Mr Brokenshire, he did seek to contact me before the Home Secretary statement, but because I was on the move with ministerial engagement, I didn't speak to him later till later in the day. However, uh, the only information I think it would be fair to say that officials in this working for myself was that something was on the move. Uh, that came very late in the day and days just before, and the only intimation we got was at 10.20 a.m. on the day the statement was made. Will there be any, followed by Sandra White? Sometimes I think this government revels in being insulted by the UK government. The, what, is, what I want to know from the Justice Secretary is, as he knew this was coming, as he knew that a reaction was required to the ECJ judgment, what efforts did he and his officials make to communicate their views to the UK government about the changes that were required? He doesn't actually have to wait to be asked. Surely he's a bit more forthcoming than that. Cabinet Secretary. Well, 
Well, uh, as I was saying to Marco Biaggi, and I can reiterate to Willie Rennie, uh, we did not receive any intimation or communication from the UK Government until 10.20 a.m. on that morning. Uh, officials had been advised that something was brewing. They were not in the loop and had been kept out of it. I have to say, I think with regard to Mr Rennie, uh, I have condemned the processes here. I do accept that there is a principle, and in principle we do have to have data retention. It is where you set the mark and how you ensure that we uh, have appropriate safeguards. But let me quote, not from the SNP group, but let me quote from Shami Chakrabarti, Director of Liberty, because what she said is the government, the Liberal Conservative Coalition has shown contempt for the rule of law by ignoring the Court of Justice. It has shown contempt for parliamentary sovereignty. Our elected representatives will just have just one day to consider a bill with huge implications for the nation's privacy, making proper scrutiny, amendment or even debate impossible. Ms Chakrabarti, who I have the highest respect for, clearly felt it was disrespectful to the Westminster Parliament. She did not even consider how disrespectful it was to the Scottish Parliament. Sandra White, followed by Graham Pearson. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. It seems that the issue here at stake is basically non-consultation. So can I perhaps go back a wee bit and can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how often the Scottish Government was consulted about the issue of retention of communication data and investigative powers prior to the legislation being announced? Cabinet Secretary Hill. Well, no, we weren't consulted. The only discussion I had was with James Brokenshire. It was, as I say to his credit, he wished to make it just before the Home Secretary went into the Chamber. As a result of commitments for both of us, it wasn't until this Home Secretary had in fact made our statements. I find that highly regrettable. I made that clear to him. I did also make it clear that I did accept the principle for there being data retention, but there are clear questions that have to be answered, raised by David Davis, raised by Tom Watson, raised by my own parliamentary colleagues, raised by organisations such as Liberty. As I also said in the statement, we are all on the same side here in keeping our community safe, tackling trafficking, protecting communities here and elsewhere from terrorism. I think it disrespectful and I think almost sometimes harmful that this failure to take people into the loop was shown, not simply here, but indeed to their own colleagues south of the border. Graham Pearson, followed by Bruce Crawford. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I do identify with the comments of Tom Watson, and I can appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary feels bruised by the process and the way it's been conducted. I am pleased that, nevertheless, uh, we are in agreement about the interim solution that's been arrived at at UK level. I would hope in a, a moment of self-awareness he will consider the circumstances in his approach to what we previously discussed in terms of the arming of police and uh, the year that we lost in policy development terms there. That said, of the £2.5 billion that the government has identified to spend in defence, has he worked out how much will be ring-fenced to deal with the challenges of cybercrime and di digital communications in light of this current challenge? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I think cybercrime is obviously going to be a matter that is currently under review by Police Scotland, engagement both with police services south of the border and indeed both European-wide and internationally. Cybercrime is a matter that is, as I say, of growing concern. It's clearly raising. I think, as with all aspects of crime, uh, the people best placed to deal with that, to make an assessment of the risk, to make an assessment of what action requires to be taken, are indeed, as I say, the police and the chief constable, tied in with, I think, obviously, information that would be put in because of the nature sometimes of those that would be involved in it that would come in from the security services. I do believe that that is an operational matter. I do believe, though, that we do have to have appropriate safeguards and checks and balances, and I do believe that we also have to ensure appropriate discussion and debate, and that did not take place here. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Crawford to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, in regard to the respect agenda as quoted in the Cabinet Secretary's statement, does the Cabinet Secretary recall that David Cameron also said that this agenda is about Parliament's working together of governing with respect, because I believe Scotland deserves that respect? Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that by proceeding with the RIP legislation, without even the most rudimentary consultation with this Parliament, that the UK Government has shown its true colours in its disregard for this very institution, the Scottish Parliament? If that is not bad enough, does he also agree with um, people like the veteran Labour MP David Winnock, 
who said, I consider it to be an outright abuse of parliamentary procedure, or even Labour MSP MP Tom Watson, who called it an insult and democratic banditry. Cabinet Secretary. Sherry is used about the respect agenda not being adhered to. I think that is a matter, as I say, of concern. I did intimate that to James Brokenshire, that process had not been followed. I think it is for the reason that we have all been discussing on all sides of chamber. We are all on the same side in tackling terrorism, protecting our communities from those who would harm it. This impacts not just Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Pearson suggests that I may be bruised. I, 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 I do not take it personally. These things go in uh, the rough and tumble of politics. But it is a disrespect to the government. It is a disrespect to the Parliament of Scotland. We have to remember that in previous incidents, in particular, I highlighted in my opening statement the incident we faced and the challenges we faced at Glasgow Airport. Security services co cooperated with the police in Scotland. The Lord Advocate, then Dame Ailey Shangelini, took charge but cooperated with law enforcement south to the border. We did so because we knew not only had an atrocity been perpetrated here, but atrocities had been and were being planned south of the border. We cooperated to make sure that we shared our resources, shared our skills, shared everything to make sure that we kept our communities safe, because a crime against one is a crime against all, irrespective of where it is perpetrated. So it is disrespectful, as I say, to the Government and Parliament. It is also disrespectful to those who serve to make our communities safe, who work with colleagues in other agencies, in other uh, jurisdictions. That, as I say, where I think the greatest disrespect has been shown. Can I just say to members, I have got uh, three members who uh, wish to ask a question. Uh, we finish at five o'clock, so I can be slightly more generous than usual. Patrick Harvey, followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As I understand the SNP's position from the White Paper, it says that some of the work undertaken by security and intelligence services means, by necessity, interference with the privacy of specific individuals. And the Cabinet Secretary in his statement refers to would-be terrorists, drug dealers, human traffickers and others. I don't think anybody would reject the idea that those kind of specific individuals might be targeted in this way. But is this clearly a rejection by the Scottish Government of the approach from the UK, which represents the routine mass surveillance of the entire population of the country? And can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that if he has the responsibility in future for updating legislation in this area, uh, as he suggests, that that legislation will prohibit the routine mass surveillance of the entire population? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say I uh, do agree, and I, I think Patrick Harvey uh, shares the views that we all do. Uh, those people who would perpetrate evil, whether for terrorist purposes or indeed whether simply for their own gratuitous financial or other uh, gain, uh, do require to be dealt with, and they sometimes require to be dealt with in a covert and subversive way, but we have to ensure appropriate checks and balances. With regard to the situation of the White Paper, uh, we have specified that we do and will have a security service. I think it is important that we should set separate the police service from the security services. Uh, they will be held accountable with parliamentary scrutiny here, as well as with uh, commissioners to address it. I think it is all about where we set the bar. What I can say to Mr Harvey, I do not think these are decisions for me. We have laid out what the basis will be. Ultimately, it will be for this Parliament that has the powers to decide at what level, to what distance they wish their members to go. I think I find it incredible that the Scottish Parliament would wish to wholesale replicate what we see happening down south. We would wish to ensure that we had balanced proportionality to protect our people, to pursue those who would cause us harm, and not to interfere with the rights of the ordinary citizen to go about their daily business. That is my own personal view, but it will be for this Parliament, with all the scrutiny and safeguards and checks and balances, that we will be built in to decide. Christina McKelvey, then finally Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Just following on those final comments from the Cabinet Secretary there, can I ask him what priorities an independent Scotland will have for investigatory powers? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think those priorities will be the information that uh, is available to those in charge of the security services and indeed to the Chief Constable. They will require to consider the threat assessment as they do. They will take that on board. What we are quite clear as a government, I think, and quite clear as an administration, this is about protecting our people from harm, protecting others because bombings, whether in Madrid or London, are as reprehensible as a bombing that would take place here, protecting us from those who would harm us and are operating in cyberspace, as uh, Mr Pearson has alluded to, whether they are operating in the Philippines, Nigeria or indeed in our own jurisdiction. It is about ensuring that, but taking on board the points relevantly and cogently made by Mr Harvey, that it is about a proportionality, a reasonableness and making sure that we have got the appropriate scrutiny to protect the ordinary individual, meanwhile being able to pursue those who would harm us. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. And like my Labour colleagues, can I uh, say to the Cabinet Secretary that I share his disappointment at the lack of proper consultation and uh, debate in advance of this legislation. Can I ask him, however, to clarify whether he is uh, proposing any substantive change to the legislation before us, as he does not appear to be doing so? And can I also ask him, uh, given that uh, fact, uh, in his statement he said that where the power of the state, and I quote, where the power of the state impinges on the liberty of its citizens, then it is imperative that elected representatives must always have an opportunity to debate the issues. Can I ask him why he believes that principle should apply to data retention, but should not apply to the carrying of firearms, where Scotland faces a radical change in policy direction? Until five o'clock, well, well, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. It is rather bizarre that having given a statement, having had these questions, having a police committee, having a Scottish uh, police authority, uh, having HMICS, a quarterly review, uh, and indeed the PERC, uh, Mr McIntosh should still come and labour uh, the point when, in fact, the whole criticism by his own members south of the border and indeed Conservative members is of a lack of discussion and indeed uh, scrutiny. What I can indicate is that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, no intention of seeking to replicate simply the position that exists south of the border. I can't decide how I would vote because this is at the moment reserved and therefore I have no vote. It is also difficult for me to comment because I have not been privy to the debate or the information, and that is part of our complaint about the lack of a respect agenda. But what I can say is that I believe that after the yes vote on the 18th of September, we will ensure that our people are protected. We will ensure that we play our part in protecting the citizens in other jurisdictions, but we will do so by also ensuring that there is proportionality and appropriate checks, balances and safeguards. That concludes the statement on the Data Retention Investigatory Powers Act UK legislation. We now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10712.1 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, which seeks to amend motion number 10712 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on Scotland and Malawi be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The, Parliament is therefore, the amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10712.2 in the name of Murdo Fraser, which seeks to amend motion number 10712 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on Scotland and Malawi be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10712 in the name of Hamza Yousaf as amended twice on Scotland and Malawi be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion as amended twice is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who will leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.